Moved by Commissioner Berkeley, second by Commissioner Hassan. All in favor? Motion 9-0. The, the public board meeting is officially open, and I apologize again for the delay um, in the starting of the meeting. Um, I'd like to invite, um, yeah, I'd like to invite the, is the JROTC from Carver here? Can you get them, please? Thank you very much. If you're going to, now would be the time. If you're going to, now would be the time, because you'll just miss the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to um, ask everybody to rise for the presentation of colors and the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I'd like to recognize and thank the members of the JROTC from the Carver Vocational Technical High School, Cadet Captain Stevie Bates, Color Commander, Cadet First Lieutenant Lenar Gross from the National Colors, Cadet Sergeant First Class Christian Hallman, State Colors, 
Cadet Major Travis Williams, the rifleman, and Cadet Staff Sergeant Emanuel Downing, rifleman. Thank you very much. I'd now like to ask Commissioner Canham to lead us in a moment of silence for the passing of several of our city school students. I would like to take the time to recognize the passing of two of our city school students. Ray Glasgow III was an 11th grader at Baltimore City College. He was the epitome of a model student and athlete. He was every teacher and coach's dream. Ray put forth great effort in the classroom, working hard to achieve success in a challenging IB curriculum. As an athlete, he excelled in two sports, lacrosse and football. He was the captain of the winning city lacrosse team, already receiving college recognition for his skills on the field as a junior. Ray continually demonstrated the, de the leadership, skill set, and sportsmanship qualities warranted in an athlete. In football, he was on pace to be an integral part of the upcoming scenes, uh, up coming season's game plans, demonstrating the same qualities and character as in lacrosse. Ray will be truly, truly missed, not only as a very good student, but as a fine young man, full of respect, humility, honesty, commitment, and promise. Jordan DeShields. Jordan DeShields was a 10th grader at the New Era Academy. One of Jordan's teachers remembers how he was very popular in school and had a beautiful smile. He was also very respectful and polite. Jordan was very close to his brother, Tristan. These two young men were always together in school, at home and everywhere. His teacher, his teacher always so shared that when you'd see Jordan, you knew Tristan wasn't far behind, and the bond they shared was unlike any I have witnessed among siblings. Jordan was, Jordan was kind of a loving man who will be greatly missed by his family and school community. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve the prior meeting, uh, the prior open meeting minutes? Moved by Commissioner Berkeley, second. Commissioner Canham, all in favor? Commissioners Pena, McFadden, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Berkeley, Richardson. Motion passes 7-0 seven, seven. Seven with three absent. Can I now have a motion to approve uh, the prior closed session summaries? Moved by Commissioner Chinia, second. By Commissioner Richardson, all in favor? Commissioners McFadden, Hassan, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Berkeley, Richardson. Motion passes 8 0 with 2 8, no, 7 0 with 2 absent. I'd now like to have um, committee reports. I believe that the two uh, committees who have met since the last board meeting are the Operations Committee and the Policy Committee. So I'd like to start with. Uh, uh, presentation uh, from the policy committee because teaching and learning has it have you met since last time I didn't think so can we start with a uh, policy committee please okay can we start with the operations committee report yes um, um, actually uh, everything went very well oh, everything went very well um, I um, I had many questions at the at the operation committee, and did the staff did a great job in assisting me in reviewing some things that I was concerned with. And after reading my um, documents that was presented to me by the operation committee, I'm satisfied and happy to say that I'm want to move forward with it. Okay, uh, Commissioner Hassan on policy committee. Thank you all. I wanted to make sure I had the letters right. And without the letters in front of me, there's no way I was going to remember. So uh, at the last policy meeting, we did uh, we discussed policy JICK, bullying, harassment, and intimidation of students. Uh, we also discussed policy GBN, the appointment, assignment, transfer, probation, and election to tenure, resignation, and retirements of faculty and staff. 
and then uh, policy GCC um, absences um, and procedures report. Uh, that was no, actually that part was tabled. Um, great conversation really dug in fairly deeply to how we are working around bullying and harassment and some spaces that we need to really fully develop. Fortunately, um, we are going to have a public board work session or board forum on June 19th from 4 to 6 p.m. to hear what the public wants in an equity statement or an equity policy as we move forward, hoping that many of the bullying and harassment issues that we're seeing in city schools will be able to be addressed by a blanket statement or policy um, that will be under development. So strongly encourage anyone interested in weighing in. Uh, we're trying to do policy differently this time in that we want to hear from the community prior to drafting a policy statement or, um, or a policy in and of itself. So again, that's June 19th from 4 to 6 p.m. And if you would like to sign up for public comment to be a part of that conversation, you can do so at board at bcps.k12.md.us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is part of board chair comments. Um, there's a citizen, uh, citizen who resides outside of the state of Maryland who identified a, a technicality in the way we were recording um, uh, closed meeting session uh, summaries. And so um, as a result of that complaint, I want to read um, the mandated response from this board on that Open Meetings Act complaint. So here we go. In March, a citizen filed a complaint against this board with the State of Maryland's Open Meetings Compliance Board. The complaint alleged in part that this board violated the Open Meeting Act with regard to written disclosures, quote unquote, closing statements, that it makes before closing an open meeting. Specifically, the complaint alleged that this board's written closing statements did not contain all of the information required by the Open Meeting Act. This board filed a response to the complaint and conceded that it had omitted required information from the closing statements. As a result, and in accordance with the law, this board is required to publicly announce this violation and provide an oral summary of the opinion, which is as follows. On May 11, 2018, the Compliance Board found that the Board violated the Open Meetings Act by failing to provide all of the required information on many of its closing statements in 2017. As an example, this Board's November 28, 2017 discussions regarding union contract extensions, personnel employment and payroll reports, as well as fair student funding litigation did not violate the Act as these three topics were exempt from public discussion in accordance with the law. However, this Board conceded that we had omitted the personnel employment and payroll item and fair student funding formula litigation topics from its November 28, 2017 closing statement, although the discussion was captured in our minutes. The omission of these topics from the written closing statement constitute a violation of the Open, Open Meetings Act. Additionally, other closing statements failed to provide an adequate description of the topics to be discussed as well as the rationale setting forth why public discussion was not appropriate. The Compliance Board found the claimed exceptions permitted the discussions at issue in this matter and we note only that a more complete description in the minutes might have avoided the allegation. The allegation that this board should be required to video record the actual vote to close each session was dismissed. Please know that this board takes the findings seriously and that it will take the necessary steps to prevent any future violations. Board members have a signed copy of the, of the opinion and, as required and will return it to the Compliance Board. The full text of the opinion may be found on the Compliance Board's web page, which is part of the Attorney General's website. There you have it. And with that, um, I'd like to, so thank you for your um, patience with that matter. Um, I'd like to invite the Baltimore, honest to God, that's the English we were provided from the Act. So you violated the, the Act and corrected it? We have corrected it. It's been corrected. Thank yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to now invite um, the Baltimore Arts Education Initiative forward to uh, make a presentation.
and uh, the Board of Commissioners, thank you so much for having us here tonight. Um, thank you for including us in your comments, Commissioner Kashani. My name is Julia DeBuslo, and I'm the Director of Arts Every Day. Over the past year, I've had the honor to work with over 100 artists, educators, community members, students, uh, and uh, district leaders to draft a plan for increasing access to the arts across the district. I want to give special thanks to Chief Connolly, the teaching and learning team, the, and Commissioner James Sassan for assisting us in all of this writing process. It's been truly an honor to work with you all. Next. <clears throat> so, Across all priorities, the issue of equity was a primary focus. Over the past several years, we have noticed a decline in the number of fine arts teachers across the district, which has been very troubling. We already knew that we had inequitable access to uh, visual art, music, theater, and dance um, prior to 2012-13, but even after that, we have seen a steady decline in the total number of teachers. Based on our understanding and the data uh, collected through the Office of Accountability and the uh, Human Capital Office, we see that only about 50% of all schools are offering music education each year, and 75% of schools have an art, a visual arts teacher in the classroom each year. Um, and only a handful of schools are offering theater and dance. Clearly, we have to make some changes in order to provide a comprehensive arts education that meets national and state standards for every student. While it is true that there are many wonderful partners who provide arts enrichment programs to schools, these experiences cannot take the place of sequential instruction year to year. And we wanted to address this in our planning process through the Baltimore Arts Education Initiative. The initiative is a collective impact initiative coordinated by Arts Every Day in partnership with Baltimore City Public Schools and was made possible thanks to funding from the National Endowment for the Arts and the T. Rowe Price Foundation. Uh, tonight we will give an overview of um, a few of the key pieces that um, we addressed as part of our first goal, which is to develop a district-wide fine arts plan. Um, and present it to you. You should have received the full text of the uh, plan in your documents as well. Um, we here Thank to you tell for us, that. We, here, we did receive it. Great. Here to tell us more is uh, Chanel Howard, who is the Fine Arts Coordinator for the district. Good evening, Chiefs, Commissioners. The Baltimore Arts Education Plan is part of a world-class, well-rounded education that every city school student needs and deserves. We are setting the goal that within the next 10 years, city school students will graduate with the collaboration, communication, creative, and critical thinking skills they need to be well-prepared for college and or the workforce through the implementation of the BAE plan. The plan was completely implemented, the plan when completely implemented will ensure that every Baltimore City student will complete sequential courses of study in dance, media art, music, theater, and visual arts taught by qualified teachers that meet the rigorous expectations of the national and state standards. Sorry about that, had a little clicker trouble. By school year 2022, all pre-K through grade five students are enrolled in visual art and music classes each year with dance and theater units taught in physical education and language arts. All students in grades six through eight will be enrolled in an arts class and choose from two or more arts subjects, visual arts, music, theater, or dance each year. Students can choose an arts focus by enrolling in the same arts subject each year. All students in grades 9 through 12 will choose from all art subjects to complete the art graduation requirement. Students can enroll in one or more art subjects each year to specialize and prepare for college and or a career in the arts. Updates to budget guidance will be introduced as part 
of the budget process for school year 1920. Curriculum will be refined, all arts curriculum, sorry, will be, provi will be refined to provide teachers with tools and assessments aligned to state and national fine arts standards, which support sequential instruction and ensure students achieve skills levels necessary to pursue careers and lifelong participation in the arts. The first wave of this refinement, the music and visual arts curriculum was just approved by the board. We thank you very much. Some schools will choose to integrate the arts into math, language arts, science, and social studies instruction to improve student engagement and ability to apply knowledge and concepts. Schools will have access to arts partnership programs in school, after school, and in the summer that celebrate student voice, culture, and traditions. Schools will be supported by the recruitment and employment of qualified arts teachers, central office arts discipline specific resource staff, professional development for arts teachers, evaluation tools, and professional development for principals and administrators, sequential arts curriculum aligned to the state and national standards, access to arts supplies and equipment, music instruction, and appropriate spaces for arts instruction. In partnership with Arts Every Day, Baltimore City Schools will publicly release annual updates on how we are doing on the plan. Eventually, we hope to see an arts education map of Baltimore City on the internet, updated annually to provide information on arts classes, programs, and partnerships offered at each school in the district, helping families to make informed choices for their students and providing guidance for the district implementation of the, Bar of the, arts, of the Baltimore Arts Education Plan. Ultimately, our vision is for every student to have an arts-rich learning experience based in sequential arts instruction, supported by arts integration, partnership, and after-school programming. I just want to acknowledge the uh, people in the audience that have also been contributing to the plan. If you could raise your hand or stand um, where you're sitting. Um, and just let's give a, a big thank you to everyone who contributed to the writing. Thank you. Here to close us out tonight is uh, one of Baltimore City Public School's finest young students uh, who will be going on to college next year, Ms. Alexandra Grayson. And Allie, you're going to tell us where you're going to college? And Yes. <laughs> um, I'm Alexandra Grayson. I'm a senior at Baltimore City College, and I'll be attending Howard University as a political science major in the fall. Woohoo! <laughs> and just an edit editorial comment here she's also one of the student leaders who has made it possible for Baltimore to ban styrofoam. She is one of those leaders. <laughs> Um, so on top of doing environmental work, I also hold the um, arts experiences I've had in Baltimore City Public Schools very dear to my heart. Um, I'm in theater classes at Baltimore City College, and um, this year in class I wrote a piece that was based on an international theory um, that was about a difficult time in my life, and I think that showed me a lot about the importance of vulnerability and um, the importance of like voices in telling our stories. Um, and that motivated me to become a political science major in a sense. Um, so that's that. And the confidence I gained in my arts classes, and specifically my theater classes, helped me um, with the next stage of my life and helped me with advocating for other students um, with the Arts Education Initiative and um, BOPA's Youth Arts Council. Um, unfortunately, not everybody in city schools gets the same education I get at city. We don't get the same education people outside of the city get um, in terms of um, arts education because of many reasons, but hopefully, as I leave Baltimore City Public Schools, um, the implementation of this strategic arts plan um, 
will give all of us access to um, the plethora of benefits that um, our arts education provides. Um, thank you. Thanks, Allie. So as we move forward, we will be uh, hoping to update the board annually with progress on the plan and we'll continue to uh, our work with the Office of Teaching and Learning. Um, I want to give a big thank you to Chief Connolly for his leadership in the work around this plan um, and uh, just thank the administration for your partnership. Um, this will require some changes going forward as far as uh, budgeting goes and the budget guidance for principals and we will be uh, updating the board and working with um, the staff to be able to do that. Um, the entire plan is posted online uh, at the city schools website under parents and families um, and will be posted for public comment uh, through the end of June. Terrific. Um, open for questions? So I have a, a question, and I, I, I'm looking at our presenters as well as Chief Connolly. Um, it's an impressive collaboration, thoughtful process, so thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate Commissioner Hassan for um, being present as a board member and during that, the deliberations for that. Um, I just want to, I'm curious what you think the, um, the biggest barrier is, because there's a lot of goodwill um, in the academics office, in the leadership office, um, to make this happen. Um, and I just would, and I think the present the plan for updating the board and the public on the progress is also thoughtful and that's that's fantastic um, so I, I'm, I'd be interested at the outset what you see as the biggest barrier so uh, we are standing in partnership with all of the statewide work around making the entire pie bigger uh, we know that the funding is not equitable um, for Baltimore City and that there is a lot of advocacy needed in terms of the Kerwin Commission and other um, other places where there should be improved funding structures for Baltimore City. Um, the intent for this planning process taking place now in, at, in this moment in time is to really set the intention and priority um, that the arts are important for Baltimore City Public Schools, that there is a huge uh, groundswell of community support for the arts um, in addition to the many parents and students that, that benefit from it. Um, and it's also to begin laying the groundwork for uh, the work that we need to do with principals um, in making sure that they are staffing up towards uh, better access across visual art and music in particular as starting point. We ultimately want to see access to all of, all of the art disciplines, but visual art and music is a good starting point because we are closest to achieving 100% access. Um, so in the coming year, we'll be uh, working with um, parents and community members to help uh, get the word out to principals. Uh, we're also hoping to present the plan um, during the principal trainings this summer. You want to add? I just I want to let Commissioner Con or Chief exactly, Connolly respond to my exactly what I would say. I'll just add that how we also provide support to school leaders, like myself as a principal. You know, I never taught in any sort of arts class, so how do we help support them with the tools and resources so that they could lead through this as well? Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. So I'd like to use this as a platform to also do a call to action to my colleagues in higher education. The people coming in as freshmen this year will be graduating with their teaching degree in 2022, which is when we need faculty and staff. And so we're going to have a talent vacuum unless we as in higher ed are able to ramp up our production of arts teachers that are highly qualified, as well as investigating alternative pathways for our artists so that they can become licensed so they can be in, in classes with kids. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Nice to see you, Allie. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge um, some gifts to the district. Um, acknowledgement of a gift of $1,000 to the Athletic Department of Blueford Drew Jemison STEM Academy West from the Van Dyke Family Foundation. Acknowledgement of a gift of $480 towards student activities at Blueford Drew Jemison STEM Academy West from the Employee Char Charity Organization of Northrop Grumman. 
Acknowledgement of a gift of $500 worth of championship rings to Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School from Alberly, Albury Products Incorporated. Acknowledgement of gift of $2,500 worth of championship rings to Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School from Larry Jennings. Acknowledgement of a gift of $2,500 worth of championship rings to Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School from James Grant. Acknowledgement of a gift of $1,000 towards repairing the stage at Carver Vo Vocational Technical High School from the Carver Alumni Association of Baltimore. And an acknowledgement of a gift of $89,000 worth of Green Healthy Smart Challenge and Baltimore Energy Hub grants awarded to 53 different city schools from the Baltimore Community Foundation. Uh, the Baltimore Community Foundation uh, is one supporter of that work, but we pull money from, uh, I work for the Baltimore Community Foundation, and so the money is pulled from various sources, so I want to acknowledge other contributors to that work, Constellation and Exelon Company, Enterprise Community Partners, the Krieger Fund, Fund for Change, and numerous individual donors. So thank you to everyone for your additional support to our students and city schools. With that, I'd like to take a motion for the approval of the personnel and quasi, the consent agenda that is comprised of the personnel and quasi-judicial quasi matters, the one appeals and hearings case. Motion. Motion by Commissioner Hassan, second. Second by Commissioner Bondima, all in favor? Commissioners bon, uh, McFadden, Hassan, Bondima, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley. Motion passes 7-0 with two absent. And with that, I'd like to turn it over for, to the CEO for her comments. Thank you, Commissioner Kashani. Uh, and for I'm going to invite uh, Chief Grant Skinner um, for tonight's uh, PAP agenda, please. Good evening, Commissioners and Dr. Santelises. We have three uh, appointments to announce this evening. First, uh, Tracy Carter, currently principal of Grove Park Elementary Middle School, is appointed director of operator support in the chief of schools office effective July 1st. Second, Robin Marshall, currently data analyst in student transportation, is appointed assistant director of transportation effective May 23rd. And I think Robin is here. And third, Keisha Matthews Trainham, currently curriculum coordinator for college and career readiness at Maryland State Department of Education, is appointed principal of Garrett Heights Elementary Middle School, effective July 1st. Okay. And I'm going to ask um, Ms. Keisha Matthews uh, Trainum to remain standing or stand again. Um, and as is our uh, practice, um, I want to read a bit more um, about uh, Ms. Matthews uh, Trainum, uh, who will be assuming uh, the principalship. Um, Keisha Matthews Trainum currently supports curriculum design and professional development on the college and career readiness team at the Maryland State Department of Education. She began her career in Baltimore City Schools as a math and science teacher. Over 10 years before going to work with MSDE, she served here as a professional developer, an academic content liaison, and a STEM coordinator. Ms. Matthews Trainum holds degrees from the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, and Drexel University. She is also pursuing a doctorate in science education from Morgan State University. We welcome her with all of her expertise in curriculum, instruction, and student learning back to city schools as the principal for Garrett Heights. Uh, before we uh, move on to um, the rest of my comments, I also um, want to take some time um, to recognize Dr. Ken Thompson, who has served as our Chief Information Technology Officer. Dr. Thompson began his tenure with City Schools in January 2012 as Director of IT Infrastructure, 
but within a year, and I remember that, Ken, um, he transitioned quickly to become the Chief Information Technology Officer. In that role, Dr. Thompson has overseen the implementation of significant upgrades to our IT systems, both here at the district office and in our schools. Most recently, he led the effort to develop a proposal that promises to dramatically increase the speed and capabilities of our internet infrastructure district-wide while providing city schools with the technological framework we will need over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, at this time, um, I will say that we are very sorry to lose Ken's expertise, but we are grateful for his contributions to our staff and students, and we wish him well in his future endeavors. Um, Ken, on behalf of um, City Schools, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you for your contributions to City Schools. And one of the stories, if Ken will permit me to tell, um, his, uh, when he told his, his wife it was time to transition, she immediately booked um, 30 days worth of vacation um, <laughs> as, soon, as soon as he's leaving. But Ken, again, we just want to thank you for your service and thank you for all you've given to city schools and our young people here. Thank you, Ken. Okay, moving forward, um, I would also like to uh, continue this evening um, by recognizing a wonderful example of student voice that highlights yet another aspect of the talents that our students demonstrate when they are given the opportunity and encouragement. The Morrell Park Story Project was led by Ms. Danielle, is it Bagonis? Very good. Bagonis, who teaches seventh and eighth grade social studies. I am very pleased to welcome Ms. Bagonis, Principal Nichelle Johnson, and four of the students who participated in the Morrell Park Story Project, Zoe Wendler, Deasha Harris, uh, Nakira Davis, and Joe Lewis. I'd like to invite you to all to the front. And um, as they're coming to the front, we will begin um, by showing you a brief video about the project. <laughs> Um, brief, and then have brief remarks um, by the students themselves. And you all can take a seat at the table. We are not going to make you stand through the video. Absolutely. And we want you to have microphones when you give comments and entertain questions from the board. Hey, Rommel here to shine a light on eighth graders at Morrell Park Elementary Middle School who created videos that are personal, inspiring, and demanding of your attention. Let's take a look. It is truly project-based learning at its best right there. Well, my story, I chose to do why I started working at a young age, and I chose to interview my boss. Uh, I learned that he was like one of those church people, and that he allowed me to be in his life and let me work. I do oil changes, I do breaks. Sharing stories can be a challenge, but having access to real sources and interviews can bring a story to life. My story project is on my grandfather because he fought in the Vietnam War. So I like hearing his war story so I thought that other people should hear him because he's still living from that time. So he was a fire control technician so he helped with the guns and all that stuff. But going through this process like I got to like learn deeper about them. Nakira and Chelsea shared difficult personal stories about losing a sister to domestic violence and struggling with an eating disorder. My sister, she gave up, like, she wanted to be a nurse, but she gave it all up because of a boy that wanted to run the street. And I wanted to show that to other girls that they don't need a boy and they can do whatever they want to put their mind to. Yeah, because, like, I never really, like, accepted the fact that I got over it. Like, I always, like, thought in my head, and, like, I never, like, really got to express, like, how I felt about it or, like, to even tell anyone about it. So now it's just, like, really good for me. Students supported each other to tell stories that are not easy to share. But through this work, healing can take place. Like we really never got to express how we felt because it was always bottled up inside because we thought no one would care, no one would bother to listen. But now it's just like everyone's listening, so it's more like powerful for us. It helps me like because maybe one day if I could just save one person's life from going through what my sister did, that's all that would matter. Clearly, the eighth graders at Morrell Park are smart, talented, caring students with voices and stories that should be heard. 
our vision and our voice can go a, lot, a long way. We can actually stand out. Like I'm saying, instead of following the right path to success, I could have went into the bad path to success. There are great things happening in Baltimore City Schools, and we need to accentuate the good because these kids are amazing, and I'm proud of every single one of them. All of the student work premiered at the George Museum of Maryland on March 22nd, but be on the lookout for a 30-minute documentary captured by film students from Johns Hopkins University. This has been Rommel Gaynor, City School Student Media Team. See you next time. So we're going to invite um, these young people from Morrell Park and their teacher, Ms. Bogonis. And we can get you a chair, too, Ms. Bogonis. We can have um, one of our staff bring you over a chair, as well as for the principal, if you'd like to be there, too. OK? We are not rationing chairs. <laughs> And um, I also want to give a shout out to our student media team here at City Schools. Um, you do a better job often times uh, than our mainstream press in finding the wonderful stories in City Schools. So kudos to our uh, press team. So I'm just going to open it up now um, for you all to talk a little bit about your work and for board members to be able to ask questions. So um, first of all, thank you for inviting us here. We feel honored that you wanted um, us to be here and we're very excited, so thank you. Um, this was a, this baby, <laughs> this uh, came out of the Jewish Museum partnership that mm. Morel Park has with them. Um, this past summer I was approached by, I'm Eileen Dackman from the Jewish Museum and Scott Fuqua, a local artist and uh, young adult author. And basically they came to me and was like, we want to do a project on stories. And Eileen absolutely loves Morrill Park. She's worked with us for many years. Um, and she knows that pretty much I'm up for anything. So um, what was great is uh, Mr. Scott and Miss Eileen and then two film students, Miss Amelia and Mr. Daniel from Johns Hopkins Film School, they came in starting in October. Um, and if anyone knows, you know, especially our, our young people, they need to build a relationship for them to trust you. And so they may not have started the process of the projects probably till after History Day in February, but they came regularly and met with them. And the kids felt they could trust their stories with these, with these new people in their lives. Um, and so when they approached me with this project, I had no idea where it was going. Um, and where it ended, and I don't feel like to say the word end because I think this is the beginning, um, was beyond my wildest dreams. Um, these kids, like I, Chelsea in the video said it best, was they never felt that they, they had a voice. They didn't feel like anybody cared what they had to say. And this project allowed them to choose something important to them, any story they wanted to tell, and everybody listened and everybody showed up for them um so it was it was probably out of my 11 years of teaching the most amazing project that i've had the honor of being part of so joe you want to say that? Oh, right. joe prepare to speak <laughs> um okay well hey guys some of you probably know me already but if you don't, my name is Joseph Lewis, and I'm a regular kid that did the story project. When I first did the project, I thought, I thought um, it was stupid and a waste of my time. <laughs> and when I began, I felt as though that I actually liked it and it actually brought out stuff that I didn't know about myself. I said, I also realized that people cared about random kids. It also upper, it also uppered my self-esteem um, and made me realize what I had. So I'm thankful for y'all. I truly appreciate it. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> Good job, Joe. 
Okay, so my name is Zoe Wendler, and unlike Joe, when we first started this project, I was actually interested in it because, <laughs> because I like putting, I don't want to say business out, but I like telling stories and letting people like hear what I have to say, so I guess you could call me like a critic sometimes. So this story project really helped me express myself and my family because my family is very diverse and I'm just grateful for letting people hear everything about my family and it really helped me get through a tough time in my life because when I was working on the project my grandmother was in the hospital and um, and it just really helped me Is there any questions y'all would like to ask? <laughs> well, I just would like to say thank you for allowing us to have a budget in order for us to purchase the um, the Apple products. So we, when they came, we didn't have anything but a few laptop carts. So because we were able to do budget enrollment and we received a few extra dollars, we were able to buy um, a cart of iPads and um, five um, Apple MacBooks. And so with this project, along with the National History Day and the Science Fair project, the middle school children were very busy. And all of this um, help lead us to now be a newly formed gal school. So I thank Baltimore City for allowing our kids to be able to shine because that's what they did. And you all are all invited on June, June 13th at 4 p.m. to see the documentary at the cafeteria. Yeah, I wanna make, so just one note on that. So. The kids all made their own documentaries. They got to choose, and they were premiered at the Jewish Museum, which was probably one of the most amazing nights of my life. And they had a red carpet for the kids. It was pretty amazing. It was, it was awesome. But this whole process was also documented to do a larger documentary from the film students in uh, Mr. S uh, in Scott Fuqua. So the kids were videoed and documented doing the project. Um, they actually went home with some of our kids, so they went home with Nakira and they went home with uh, Zoe and a few of our other students. They um, really captured the whole year of this project, and that documentary is anticipated to be done in June, where it'll be pr the, our kids will be the first to see it, which is on June 13th at 4 p.m. at our school. But that is also um, anticipated to be put into multiple film festivals and other museum competitions, and um, it is intended to go quite global. <laughs> okay, so on the night of our um, premiere thing, it really helped some of us take our minds off of the situations that we were put in do doing our stories. So like when me, Nakira, and Joe were all there, oh, and Diego, we're all there. Um, we had a blast. We ha so when we first got off the bus, it was my idea to take a bus as our limo because some of us wouldn't be able to fit in a limo since it's not that big. So we took a school bus and we got off the bus and we had a red carpet waiting there for us as promised from Ms. Pugonis. We walked in and it was like we had our own paparazzi. It was amazing. So that really brightened my mood from all the stuff I was going through. I don't know about you guys, but it did for me. So when I got to hear everybody else's stories, it made me realize how much everybody has gone through in their life. And that some people are just, well, not even some people, that everybody is strong in their own way. And the way that the other students explain their stories, such as Chelsea and Nakira, really made me have like faith and everything like you can get through anything that you push yourself for thank you and do you have a do you want to say something to us 
I'll say one thing. <laughs> Go for um, it, Joe. I just want to say, um, I felt like an adult at a black tie event went that day. <laughs> and they had a little champagne, champagne <laughs> cups. Sparkling cider. <laughs> and it actually felt kind of nice because it felt like we were all adults just talking among each other. <laughs> Would you um, um, would you mind sending the invitation to the both the 13th and the 14th to the board office so that that can get sent to all school board members? Because I'm sure that if some of us are available, we'd we'd love to do that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Great. Well, we would all just like to say thank you for everybody listening to us oh. and hearing out our stories. You're welcome. And thank you to Ms. Bagonis and Ms. Johnson for everything that you've got done for us. Thank you all. And could we invite you all? Oh, I'm sorry. First, board, were there any questions? I've Go for it. Go yeah. ahead. I, wanna, I want to celebrate Principal Johnson because it's not just the money that you receive, but it is your leadership in leveraging resources and human resources and, and, and partnerships that is credited to strong school leadership. So I just want to celebrate you and I want to celebrate the, the teacher that is with these wonderful young people and never ever again call yourself regular. Don't do that. You are exceptional young people. <laughs> with incredible stories and I wish that the media that tends to paint our That's young right. people come so on. negatively come will come into some of our schools like Morrell Park and be able to look at you all at work listen to your stories and let that blow up because you're really the rock stars I so I just want to celebrate you young people tonight you, right. you're articulate you you all look extremely great tonight you should be extremely <laughs> proud of yourself and we all are proud of you so don't don't ever call yourself regular again. You're exceptional and your futures are extremely bright. And I'm sure that all of us in this room are excited to hear more stories come out of you in the future. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. So WJZ did come out and um, they interviewed a bunch of our students and um, it aired um, for like four days straight. It was it was pretty incredible, and so we were able to get some positivity of what's going on in Baltimore. Come on. <laughs> so I'm going to invite all of the students um, to stand and receive a certificate of recognition for your amazing work and get to take a picture with um, both myself and Commissioner Kashani, the chair of the board. I couldn't say it better than Commissioner McFadden, so I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to uh, move to the next part, but just again, thank you um, to the, the students um, and uh, Ms. Bagonis for just your work around this. Um, so what's great about starting with young people is that what we could see is an example of the power of a teacher in the lives of students um, and the amazing teaching that is going on in many um, of our Baltimore City public schools. And so one of the things um, that I am really pleased and fortunate to be able to do tonight is to honor um, all of our finalists for Baltimore City Teacher of the Year this evening. And so first, 
I would like to um, welcome the semifinalists for this year's Teacher of the Year to come forward and receive their certificates of recognition. Ms. Regina Schmidt teaches sixth to eighth grade math at Hamilton Elementary School. And you can stay right there. That's all right. It just gets real crowded back here, not a lot of room. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth uh, McClure, who teaches fifth grade English language arts and social studies at Thomas Jefferson Elementary Middle. Is it Thomas? Rebecca, Rebecca Thomas Johnson. Oh, oh, sorry about that, Rebecca. Oh, okay, just tell me, your, is it Rebecca McClure? Yes. And you're at Thomas Johnson? Yeah. Right, so can I say it again, right? Okay, thank you. We have Ms. Rebecca McClure, who teaches fifth grade English language arts and social studies at Thomas Johnson Elementary Middle School. Yeah, because I don't want Mr. D shooting me darts from the, uh, from the seat. <laughs> Ms. Dorothy uh, Gluey, did I say it correctly? Glovey. Glovey. It rhymes with Chevy. Okay, sorry. <laughs> my, my, my pronunciation guide was off, so that's right. And Ms. Glovey teaches fourth and fifth grade at City Springs Elementary School. Next, I'd like to welcome Ryan Golson, who teaches music at Kip Harmony Academy. And next, let's hope I get this one right. Ms. Elena uh, Gagné, did I spell it right? Ah, ça c'est le français, that's right. It's Elena, okay. Is a special education teacher for fourth through sixth grades at City Springs Elementary School. And Ms. Janelle Coyne, did I say it correct? Yep. Great, is a sixth grade social studies teacher at Roland Park Elementary Middle. <laughs> and Ms. Ann Christen, uh, Christen Barnes, who is a sixth grade math, science, and STEM teacher at Highland Town Elementary Middle. <laughs> So these are this year's um, semi-finalists for Baltimore City Public School Teachers of the Year. And I just heard from a secret, not so secret source that um, actually uh, Ms. Galevi was discovered in a coffee shop by Commissioner Berkeley years ago and uh, to start her teaching career. That's wonderful. <laughs> I just wanted to ask a question. Could you 
very quickly just describe the accomplishment. What does this mean that they've achieved this accomplishment? How did they get here? Thank you very much, <laughs> Commissioner Frank. Um, so, well, one of the things I, I do want to say is that we have nominations. Actually, do you want to come forward and describe the process a little bit? Come, come forward. <laughs> just, just a little. We won't put you too much on the spot. I was going to say, I mean, I'm going to sit and go, but we have the expert. Go ahead and introduce yourself All right. so that we know. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sharonda Ailey, and I work in the Office of Teacher Support and Development. And the question again was... What does it mean to be here? <laughs> what did folks have to do to get here? This was not just plucking people off the street, right. correct? Okay. Yes, so the way the process works is we have a global <laughs> nomination for Teach of the Year. So it goes out through City Schools Connect and all of our different Baltimore City Schools um, communication lines. And once we have parents, community members, um, students, teachers, uh, they can nominate themselves, staff members. So it's open to the community to nominate teachers that they feel are doing some wonderful things in growing up our students. Once they make it through the nomination process, an application goes out to all of the nominees. And the nominees have the option to uh, fill out the application to participate in Teacher of the Year. And it comes back through our office where our team goes through the applications and we pick the top 10 through a scoring system and a rubric that we use. And the top 10 then are notified and congratulated, and we go out to the classrooms to actually see the students working and the, student, the teachers teaching. And from the top 10, we move into the top three. And the top three, um, we have an interview with them, and we get them ready for the interview with our CEO. And then she has the honor of choosing our Teacher of the Year. So this is, and a lot of this is due I have to say really to Sharonda's work, like she's done a fabulous job. The rigor of this process has increased immensely um, over the past year since she has been overseeing. And it's part of the reason why Baltimore City in the last four years has had two state winners and one finalist. So and that is due in large part to Sharonda's work in identifying the talent within city schools. Thanks for asking the questions. Thanks, Sharonda. Thank you. And as she just noted, I want to move to our two finalists for Teacher of the Year. Um, these are two of the three people that I had the opportunity to actually interview. Um, so as Tronda just described, I get a chance to interview the final three. Um, first, I want to say that Adam Wishart, who teaches 10th, to, uh, 10th through 12th grade chemistry at Baltimore Polytech Institute um, cannot be here. And he cannot because literally he had just been informed on his way here that his wife went into labor late this afternoon. Um, so he has definitely been excused. We had a chance, I had a chance to um, fellowship a bit with the baby who will be arriving at our Baltimore um, City Teacher of the Year um, uh, trip to Orioles Park. Um, and so we wish um, that entire family, the Wishard family, um, the best and uh, most blessed of births. We'll find out uh, in a bit whether it's a boy or a girl. So I'll let you know. Um, and then the second uh, finalist was Dr. Lisa Washington, a seventh grade English language arts teacher at Leith Walk Elementary Middle. Please come forward. And you can also bring your daughter if you'd like. Can I say, um, Ms. I need to say something. Dr. Santelis, yes. you're standing next to my student who just received her, last year received her doctorate at Morgan State University, a scholar. Dr. Lisa Washington. No, go ahead. No. <laughs> just 
say that one of the things I learned last night at Heart of the Schools and that I'm learning tonight is that like musicians, artists, athletes, um, education runs through family lines. Yeah. And so one of the things, the reason why I did that little yelp at the end um, is because I just learned that Dr. Washington's daughter is a kindergarten teacher, uh, which is wonderful. Yes, I will say, yes, and everybody was saying, oh my gosh, she teaches kindergarten? She's like so young, but it's wonderful. It's the great part about it. That's right, that's right. Oh, and then... And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Laquisha Hall. Yeah. Ms. Hall, you can come, you can come stand. I'm still, I'm still going to talk about you, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, Ms. Hall has taught English language arts at Carver since 2015. In her nearly 15-year career, she also taught at Rosemont Elementary Middle, Forest Park High School, Booker T. Washington Middle School, and other schools in the district. She holds a bachelor's degree in English from Elizabeth City State University, a master's degree in secondary education from Morgan State University, and a creative writing certificate from Wing Hill Writing School. In addition to her classroom success, Ms. Hall founded the Queendom TEA, the Etiquette Academy, mentor program for young women in 2005 to develop etiquette skills, life plans, and confidence in young women through after-school workshops, conferences, and special ceremonies. I will also say that the writing of her students uh, was a feature story on WJZ. And I will also say that her, um, uh, her work and research around teacher stress reduction um, and teacher wellness won her, gave me the advantage of being able to award her as one of the BTU um, teacher research um, recipients last year. So on behalf of everyone at City Schools, I want to congratulate again City Schools 2018 Teacher of the Year, Ms. Laquisha Hall. <laughs> So, when people ask who's doing the real work in city schools, who's making the difference, it is the folks on the ground. Um, I said last night that um, principals are the fulcrum of school improvement and school excellence in the district. I will reinvigorate that this evening, but I will add that if principals are the fulcrum, um, teachers are the energy and the work and the rest of the seesaw without which there would be no ride. So thank you all for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you Well, it would have been better had I had more time. Um, so I do want to thank you all. You make us proud, all of you. Um, to be part of city schools. And then finally, um, and unfortunately, but a little bit on an, uh, a solemn note, I want to invite everyone uh, to participate in a special day of peace and remembrance throughout Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, in the current school year, we have lost at least 10 of our students to the epidemic of violence that has ravaged our city streets and communities. This is the second year in a row. Um, I know that everyone shares not only my deep sorrow, um, but also um, our, um, 
our need to commemorate the lives of those lost, to never forget that they are more than numbers, um, that these are young lives uh, that are cut tragically short, and our hearts go out to their families and friends whose lives have also been shattered. On Wednesday, May 30th, we will honor the memory of our students in a ceremony of remembrance and an appeal for peace here at City Schools District Office. Uh, the program will begin at 9.50 a.m. with a moment of silence at 10 a.m. Schools throughout the district will conduct their own ceremonies of remembrance and participate in the moment of silence at 10 a.m. We have already heard from uh, Baltimore uh, City Council members that while they have hearings that day, they will also um, stop at 10 a.m. to participate in the moment of silence. And I want to invite everyone to join with us in honoring those we have lost and committing ourselves to supporting peace in our schools, our city, and our society. And I want to thank, again, the many teachers and principals who have been there for your communities. We have at least two principals here tonight who have lost multiple young people um, that they have poured their lives into, that their staffs have poured their lives into, and never, ever underestimate the power of your care, the power of your relationship to help heal our community. So with that, um, I wish you all um, a, a good evening, and we want you to be part of that commemoration next week. And I turn it over to Commissioner Kashani. Thank you, Dr. Santelisis. And again, uh, on behalf of the board, just, just great, awesome teachers. So glad to have you all with us tonight. Um, I want to do a review of the consent agenda items so uh, board members can let us know if you'd like to pool items for discussion. So I'm just going to run through them in order. And then we'll come back to them after public comment to see if you want to pull any more. And then we'll have responses from staff. Um, so uh, item 8.01, the feasibility study for Patterson Claremont. I, I believe we are going to pull that uh, for presentation. Okay. Um, item 8.02, the waiver request, FKA Carafest. Item 8.03, FY18, third quarter budget amendment request. Commissioner McFadden wants to pull that. Item 8.04. Oh, my bad. I, I'm sorry. Just for the sake, uh, for the public sake, this amendment. I Professional think and school related personnel contract. Item 8.05, the SY school year 2018-2019 calendar, school calendar update. Under the procurement items, 9.01, Council of Great City Schools. 9.02, Community Schools. 9.03, MABE. I need to pull that for an abstention. Okay. We'll pull 9.03. Actually, probably should put 9.01 for that yeah, same reason. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't thinking that far ahead. 9.01 as well? For, uh, just so we, can, so we can take a public vote so that, because there's an abstention on the vote? Because I sit on the Board of Directors for the Council of Greater City Schools and for the May. I need to recuse myself. Um, item 10.01, Springboard Collaborative. Item 10.02, Legacy Partners International, Renzuli Learning. Item 10.03, Restream Inc. and District Moving Companies. Item 11.01, .01, City of Baltimore. Item 13.01, .01, Coal Roofing Company. Item 13.02, .02, Chilmar Corporation. Item 13.03, .03, also, Chilmar Roofing Corporation. The first one, 13.02, uh, uh, is for Windsor Hills, and 13.03 is for Utah Marshburn, just for clarification. Item 13.04, Coal Roofing Company for Hampstead Hill. Item 13.05, Chilmar Corporation for... Where is it? 
numerous, numerous services for construction. 13.06, Nichols Contracting. So um, all items will go by consent when we vote, except for item 8.01, 8.03, 9.01 and 9.03, and after public comment, we'll ask if there's any other additions to that list. Okay. With that, we've got two of our specially recognized groups to speak with us tonight. First will be the PTA Council of Baltimore City, um, Deborah Demery. We'd like to welcome you as our first guest. So good evening, everyone. And what a coincidence. I'm going to talk about art tonight. Just don't look at my note here. PTA recognizes the important role the arts play in education because arts just make schools better. Last year, September 10th through 16th, was National Arts and Education Week and also the launch of National PTA's Reflections Program, showcasing the artistic talents of students from all over the country. The theme of the competition was within reach. Locally, we had 21 participants with entries in dance, visual, and literary arts. Thank you to Ms. Deborah Wallace, who's sitting right here with me. She was our committee chair from Excel Academy. I'd also like to thank Ms. Amanda Obi from Monarch Academy, Mr. Joe Braswell, who's our resident artist at large and participated as one of our judges. Uh, Principal Woodhouse from Excel Academy is also in the room tonight, and it's important that we have principal support with this because without the principals, we couldn't do anything. Tomorrow, we will honor all of our participants, but tonight we would like to showcase our literary arts winner from Excel Academy, Miss Bernetta Bess, who's here on the end, and she's going to read her literary um, submission. This is just a small sample of the talent that we have in Baltimore City, and we think that it's important that they be recognized. So I'll turn it over to Bernetta. Good evening. My name is Bernetta Bass, and the title of my literature is Falling Star. Today's society can distract your self-esteem with vague perceptions of immaculate dreams. Have you comparing everything you do to everything you've seen? My fellow youth are afraid to use proper English so they can no longer distinguish the vernacular when they speak, for sounding educated has been labeled as sounding weak. My ladies have laid down books, brains, and barriers and picked up tighter jeans. My men are, abandon are abandoning the babies the women they love are laboring, too busy running the streets, risking their lives, flipping chump change, trying to get it by any means. I know the feeling of manifesting anxiety inside a team. The self-mutilating oppression is so depressing. Who even knew that was a thing? Where is the progression? So many empty thrones awaiting my kings and queens. Seems like I'll never make it out, but things are rarely ever what they seem. I have attained the knowledge that everything I deem too far, I pushed out of my reach. They say knowledge is the key, so open doors are what I seek. I'm no kin of the great Dr. King, but there's a vision in my head that reoccurs when I sleep. And it is so explicitly vivid that when I awake, I still see it. The diploma that could deploy me, put me in firm position to rise against anything meant to destroy me. That big house surrounded by acres of land, that college degree that puts the world in my hands, is all in reach. For my future, I am demanding, so relentlessly I work. Early mornings, late nights, no days off, with everything in reach, I know something is going to pay off. I am destined for greatness. My success lies in my patience, and is progressed by my dedication. My talents are variated, so habits I have created to put me in a place so solidified, bad energy and failure won't penetrate it. I say all this to say, I'm just waiting on a day when I don't have to introduce myself. They already know my name. So I'm reaching. I'm reaching for it all. All my dreams will come true, and I don't need a falling star. This is 
is why we would like to encourage all students in Baltimore City, I don't care if you PTA, PTO, whatever you are, to participate in programs like this because we rarely get to see this type of talent on TV. We don't get to see this, not all the time. So thank you so much for doing this for us tonight. Thank you. We appreciate you. Excel Academy. Principal Woodhouse. South <laughs> Um, the BTU representative, our next guest, George Hendricks. Good evening, or should I say good night? The hour is late. Maybe for you, yeah, not yeah. for us. I know, y'all was going to be here. Thank you very much. Hello. But I do know the uh, feeling uh, to be at things very right late in the evening. Uh, first of all, I want to say... Um, uh, to the, uh, ch excuse me, to the Chair Commissioner, Board of School Commissioners, Dr. Santalesis, I bring you greetings on behalf of Marietta English as well as the teachers, paraprofessionals, and school-related personnel that the Baltimore Teachers Union represent. Um, it is my task to speak with you today, as in every, every meeting we have somebody here from the Teachers Union to speak to you, and it's my task to do so today. So please bear with me, and I thank you for your attention in advance. First of all, I would like to thank uh, those of you who had the opportunity to come to BTU last week um, to see our teacher leader program, um, the, the ending ceremony. Dr. Chinia, um, uh, Sean Conley was there. I, I, saw, I didn't see anybody else because I had to leave. But really want to thank you. That shows a lot to the participants. It shows a lot to BTU. And it shows that there is a level of commitment with partnerships between city schools as well as BTU. So again, we want to thank you. Moving forward, we want to talk about B3-8-2018. Um, for those of you that were not here or board members last year, the Baltimore Teachers Union will be addressing the decline in student enrollment again this summer by running the B3 program. Last summer, over a period of five weeks, 40 teachers and paraprofessionals called B3 Advocates canvassed neighborhoods throughout the city, speaking with parents and guardians to encourage them to enroll or re-enroll their children into Baltimore City Public Schools. By the end of the program, our B3 Advocates knocked on 34,106 doors had 6,217 conversations with parents and guardians about unique programming in city schools and helped enroll 418 children in pre-K and 17 dropouts to re-enroll to earn their high school diploma into Baltimore City Schools. We ask for your partnership again to help keep our parents informed and our students enrolled in Baltimore City Schools for 2018. Last meeting, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there was a budget that was passed. Um, and in that budget that was passed, there was mention of the literacy coach. Um, BTU has the question as to who are the applicants to be considered for literacy coach positions outlined in the new budget. Uh, there are currently 88 certified lead teachers in the system. 54 are still in the pool to be placed. These are the highest qualified teachers in the system who are more than qualified for the position of literacy coach. They are qualified because of these four things. They know the content. They can be creative with instruction. They know and understand Baltimore City children as well as they are sympathetic but also are able to push them to succeed. Now, the not so good stuff. Uh, BTU is concerned that, um, and I'm, I was glad to see the presentation tonight about the arts, um, that was very encouraging. One of the biggest things that we face every year, especially with budget adjustments, are, are our .5 positions. And many of our 4 .5 positions are those of resource teachers, our art teachers, our music teachers. Those are some of the, some of the most hardworking teachers in the district. And why do you say that? Because unlike traditional teachers who are housed in one location, these teachers are moved uh, to two schools. They have to service sometimes a whole population of students at a school versus a teacher who just teaches maybe fourth grade or fifth grade. So not only do they have to get to know those students at one school, but they have to get to know them at two schools. That's very problematic. Many of these people are at locations, two locations in one day. Um, and uh, we do know the contract language talks about seven hours and five minutes a day, but many of them work at schools whose start times and, and finish times are totally different. So in many cases, they're working eight hours a day. Um, and, and most of them don't say anything, but when, we, when they say something, now it's a problem and 
and they're upset and the next thing you know principals are writing those positions out of the budgets for next year because they said something in reference to what their rights are. That's very problematic. And looking forward, we definitely would like to see that those, those positions are viewed as a regular teaching position and not .5 positions, that they have full-time positions at schools and locations so that those people do not have to travel and their workload are not increased. Secondly, our paraprofessionals, specifically our, our special ed as well as our pre-K paraprofessionals used, being used as substitutes, that's very problematic. That should not happen. That is against the law as well as our contract. Please take a look at that. Look very closely into that. I'm not going to sit here and point out school specifically because that is not proper. But that is happening on an uh, uh, alarming rate where pre-K paraprofessionals are being pulled from the pre-K classroom when they should be servicing our students. Also, last year, uh, we also know that moving forward to next year, that budget adjustments, we know it's going to happen. BTU is asking that you please look at that over the summer. Last year, movement did not happen until uh, after, the third, after the first quarter, well into November. That's very prob problematic as far as relationships with teachers and students uh, when somebody has to move to a new school and get to know their students by being held to the same standard as a teacher who was there in September. Um, so we want to look at that. As, uh, oh, my time has expired. So I will uh, follow protocol here, and I'll thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Any, any uh, Commissioner Chinia? I just want to say that um, I, I really was privileged to be a part, be a presenter, and then to be at the uh, exhibition, I guess I'll call teacher it leader. that, for the teacher leaders. And um, it was really wonderful to see the work. Um, the research projects that the teachers had done. I know one of our uh, areas that we really want to focus on is this pipeline for leadership, and so I hope that we're coordinating some of our work um, at the district office with what you're doing with the BTU, but that was, um, I felt as though uh, the future looked very bright if those teachers continue to move forward. So thank you for the work that the BTU does with that program. Thank you very much. And one last thing, I just wanted to know if you could follow up with um, Chief Grant Skinner about the list of, I know you don't want to say it publicly, but if just so that we can establish a pattern rather than kind of isolate incidents about the two concerns um, okay. that you voiced tonight. That Thank you very helpful. much. We'll do. Appreciate Great. it. Thank you. Terrific. Now I'd like to turn our attention to uh, general public comment. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Commissioner, Commissioner Canham. Um, Christine Smith from the Child First Authority. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christine Smith, and I'm here to talk about the importance of the community schools, especially the one at Robert Coleman, especially Coleman. My children, Blessing and James, are both students at the at the school, and they also and I also work there as a parent investment coordinator for Child First Authority, which is one of the after school programs at Rob W. Coleman, which is also a community school. This. This is the first job I had in years. I love working with, for Child First Authority. The greatest impact that the community school has made on my life is through the gift of giving. For the last three years, I was homeless and, and at my wits. And I was basically couch surfing, and I had no idea what I was going to do. My only thought was getting my kids to school. The, the assistant principal saw me in the hallway looking very distraught, and the cry was wrong. I explained to her the predicament that I were in, had no idea how I was going to get by. I let her, I let her hear my, I, I let her know I had some personal challenges with my housing situation. After listening to me for a few minutes, Mrs. Stewart told me that she was going to make a phone Three phone calls to see if she can get me some help. With that being said, the assistant principal and staff and staff member were able to get me some assistance right away, emergency assistance right away. Our community coordinator.
and uniform for houses. I now have my own housing with my with the lease in my name. The staff at Robert W. Coleman gave me a house warming celebration to show their support for me. Principal Thompson and Assistant Principal Mrs. Stewart has taken me under their wings, and I have to help. And they have to help me realize what a powerful woman I am and became. Mother Teresa once said, "Give until give until it hurts." And I can say, without reservations, the staff at Robert Coma, along with Miss Knight, Miss Thompson, Miss Stewart, has done just that. That's what a community school does. That's how the help. They help to empower you so you can learn, learn to stand on your own feet and later help others. Thank you, thank you so much, Ms. Smith, for sharing that uh, story and the and the great the great um, work of the staff to support you at Robert Coleman. Next is uh, Douglas Bear, parent from Patterson Park Public Charter School. No problem. Hello, uh, my name is Douglas Barr. I'm the parent of three children uh, at Patterson Park Public Charter School. I'm also the PTO president at our local school. Um, I'm here tonight to ask you to mediate an end to the lawsuit between Baltimore City Public Schools and your charter school partners. I was in this room two weeks ago when the board struggled to communicate the very basics of the process used to fund your charter schools. The members of this board then voted on a billion dollar budget based on a flawed presentation that wasn't clear on the basic facts. This flawed process meant that our school lost two staff members this year, will likely lose another staff member next year, and has had to make cuts to programs throughout the school. All of this has been during a three-year period when city schools were supposed to be operating in a stabilized manner. Commissioner Frank, last week you made this statement, or two weeks ago, you made the statement that this unpredictable process was no way to operate the system. Commissioner Hassan, you made the statement that city schools need to figure out a way to be partners with the charters and work together. Commissioner Kashkiani, you explicitly said this is the time to act sooner rather than later to fix this relationship. I'm challenging this board and the CEO to agree to mediation and resolve this dispute by the start of the next school year. I know you all deeply care about all of the children in this city. I'm asking everyone in this room to follow through on what they've said and actually do something about it. Why not agree to a good faith negotiation, the way you negotiate contracts with labor unions? Why not build in requirements for charters to feed best practices and lessons learned back into the overall system? Why not build an actual partnership between charters, traditional schools, and North Avenue, rather than the zero-sum game we get year after year? Please don't waste any more of your time and money in the courts. I'm not playing the blame game here either. I delivered this same message to the administration at my school I will deliver it to the Baltimore Charter Alliance. I'm profoundly disappointed in everyone involved. I don't think I'm actually very popular with many of these groups. <laughs> um, mediate, negotiate, compromise, and rebuild the partnership with your schools. Do it before the start of next school year. The children are watching us, and they're waiting us for us to meet this challenge. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Next, we have Ariana Smith and John Brenner from the Baltimore Latin Charter School. Did they leave with the group? Okay. They signed up for public comment as well. That's okay. Um, Charles A. Duggar from BCP BCPSS. It's very interesting, you know, they used to have you sign about 4.30, and you had to sign them as quickly as you could. And then the young lady said, since not too many have signed up, you go later. But 
to speak for three minutes after waiting three hours is a serious endeavor. Uh, I want to speak about three things as quickly as I can. One is testing, one is talking about the curriculum, and one is talking about the third part, behavior. I've given Baltimore City 46 years in public education. I'm retiring at the end of this year, and it's been very disappointing. This has been my most disappointing year. About testing, we, we test too much. Uh, the children are not taking the tests as seriously as they should for the, uh, the intensity of all the data and all the media coverage that follows. I would say if you're going to do the test, take them off the computer and have them bubble in, from my experience. You know, they're too much uh, into the computers. They play games with the computers. What I've seen, they don't really take the test seriously on the computer. For us, always hear black children can't score very well, and we're the lowest of the low. Let them bubble in with that pencil, that number two. Let them think about what they're deciding to be their answer. Testing. I'm an English teacher, and this year, ninth grade, we read To Kill a Mockingbird. We read Raisin in the Sun. We read... Uh, the other Westmore, and we're reading Persepolis, which is not a good book, in my opinion. There's a lot of profanity in the book. We talk about the behavior of the children. Why is there the profanity in the book? The F word, the S word, it's dead. The girl lies to her parent. It gives a distorted view of Islam. But we're reading that book. At the end of the year, you give them a test. You call it a final exam. There's going to be 20% of these children's grade. But on the test last year when we did some... Those four books that I think they're not on the final exam. You give some excerpts from some essays, and then you want them to write. Why not at least be fair with the children and give them what's on what they were asked to read? That makes sense. I better jump on the behavior. It's not fair that teachers are asked to accept unacceptable behavior. You talk about enrollment. I heard the BTU brother talk about the enrollment. Enrollment is low because a lot of people don't want to send their children to public schools. It's great what we saw tonight, the great things that are happening, but there's another side to the coin. Every day, every day I'm bullied, at 70-year-old man, because I might say, son, get out of the hall. Sir, go to class. Sister, watch your foul mouth. Shut up, your OAMF. That's every day. That's every day. A lot of people I know stopped there after 20 years because they didn't like where behavior was going. What is the code of conduct? In the real world, they can't act this way. They're going to be unsuccessful in life, jobs, relationships, you name it. But yet we are allowing unacceptable behavior to become the norm. How's it going to be this summer? You understand? We're going to be worried how these children, we don't want to be around some of these same children because we know behavior and what it should be. And it's on us. My last point. We have these children at their peak times of energy, more than anybody else. These hours, we got to do better by them than we do. But the time is up, but it's never enough time for us who really want to make a difference because we can reclaim our youth, but we are losing them very, very seriously because we are accepting unacceptable behavior and act like it's not happening. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Duggar, and thank you so much for coming out, and I appreciate you, you sticking it out for the three hours. Can I make a point here? Sure. Mr. Dr. Duggar, Bundy. before you leave, I've been knowing him for 50 years. And I have to say, before you leave, this man has been an activist for 50 years. He spent a lot of time in the street working for Baltimore City Public Schools. And in Haiti, every year, he would go to Haiti and work with children and families in, in, in Haiti and other countries. And um, you just mentioned that you're retiring next year. This year, and I have to say that he's done a lot of work in the community and with Kwaisi and all the other activists and politicians. And I just want to say congratulations and thank you for the work that you've done with Baltimore City Public Schools. Okay, last but never least, Ms. Trueheart. minutes is not enough. Okay, budget. I have testified at Baltimore City Council that they should not, cannot, and will not approve the budget. Okay? And the rationale behind that is, is multifaceted. Um, 
Nobody's thought about increasing the number of community schools. You just had passionate testimony about the benefits of community schools. But yet neither the school board's budget nor the mayor's budget increases the number of community schools where we know our children are loved, cared for, nurtured in ways that we haven't but should. So, I'm trying to find eight city council people to vote no on the mayor's budget. I'm working on it, okay? And so what does that mean, okay? That means that we're going to come back and demand that the money be spent differently than has been put on the table. Um, let's talk about budget forms. When are you guys going to realize that the budget presentations that you give to communities and forms is not what we want? Got that yet? Because you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And there's like lunacy in this process. Okay? You know, I want to know how many black male teachers are being funded by the $1.3 billion. I saw you recognize teachers of the year. There's one black man and a bunch of white ladies. Okay? We know we need to increase the number of black male teachers in front of our classroom. Let's do that. Let's recognize. Let's elevate the few that we have. All right. Um, task force, the enrollment task force. I saw a presentation that I think is going to be presented later, the um, um, facilities master plan that has some great data. I'm geeky like that. I, I loved the presentation, okay, however voluminous it was. But what I loved about it was the demographic data, the population information, the, um, the clarity with which it was presented. And there is one slide in that presentation that in the upper right-hand corner, there's a number, 19,900 and something. And I believe that number represents the, the students who live in Baltimore City who are not attending Baltimore City schools. And, and I like verification that that's what that number is on that particular slide. And the follow-up question is, if there are 19,900-odd young people in this city who do not attend city schools, has that number been presented to this enrollment task force, how are they delving into that number, parsing it, how are we going to target those 19,900-odd children? I hope my assumption is correct that that's what that number represents, but to me that's a lot of children out there that we need to figure out, you know, sure, some of them go to private schools because their parents can afford it, Catholic school, whatever, um, but there's got to be some number of them, right, that we can attract back to this system. Um, I agree. Charlie Duggar, testing. Get rid of it. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. My time has expired. I got a lot more to say, though. No doubt. Um, yeah. But this is helpful. And I, uh, your question about the enrollment task force, um, uh, I can't say that that particular number was parsed, but I can guarantee you that that kind of data was parsed. And um, when the Dr. Santelisis, will, uh, members of her staff will make a presentation on the recommend, you know, her recommendations and what's going to, how we want to move forward with the next stages of engagement around the task force. And if after that presentation, um, you want to see and discuss some additional detail on the numbers that were parsed be more than happy to talk about with because that's exactly the kind of thinking is how do you how do you find those targets how do you find that democrat those demographics that are available for targeting and that's the exact thinking that was being used yeah, I, i'm not necessarily a fan of the enrollment task force but but since it's here let's use it and utilize oh, yeah, it no, in, no, in the most appropriate way what i was more impressed with is the presentation yeah. about population gains and losses by neighborhoods. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the painful um, reality that you look at the, the community known as Sandtown Winchester and there's no growth there. There's nothing growing there. The population is, is stagnant, you know. And 
Um, just as the last point, I'm going out to Oakland at the end of the month to participate in a trauma breakthrough series collaborative out there to share some of the things that we learned here in Baltimore around trauma <coughs> and share that with Oakland, California. And I'm excited about that because I don't think that we do enough around trauma and helping our children deal with it. This sister who here emotionally expressed that she was experiencing trauma in her life. It was impacting her children and how the community school relationship helped her through that. We got to do that across the city. It just cannot be in 50 schools. We got 170, right? And you're telling me we can only do this work in 50? There's a problem. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to ask the members of the board if based on public uh, comment, are there any additional items that you'd like to pull from consent? Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, have a motion to approve the items that went by consent. And that would be uh, all items except for 8.01, 8.03, 9.01 and 9.03. Motion to approve the other items by consent. Moved by Commissioner Bondima, second. Second by Commissioner Richardson, all in favor. Commissioners Hassan, Bondima, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley, Richardson. Motion passes 8-0 with one absent. Before we get to our um, information and discussion items, we'd like to have um, presentations for the items that were pulled. So we'll start with item 8.01, the feasibility study for Patterson Claremont. Good evening, Commissioner Kashani, board members, Dr. Santelisis. I'm Sherry Vincent. I'm the interim executive director for the 21st Century School Buildings Program. I have before you uh, an amendment request to the budget for Patterson High School. This was previously um, brought to the board, I believe, in uh, February of 2015. Uh, the enhanced approval package was approved for a budget of $95 million. If you will refer to page three in the executive summary, uh, you will see the recap. That's the one. Thank you. You'll see the recap of uh, what the uh, budget amendment is, is requested. So Patterson High School was as approved at the time um, there was, uh, it was not in the uh, public purview that the um, Patterson project was adjacent to uh, the Canaan Lombard Superfund site. Um, that information came to light um, as no one on the team at this time and it wasn't uh, brought up in the feasibility study. And no one on the team at the time had, was, uh, had personal knowledge of uh, the Superfund site, which was discovered some almost 35 years ago. Um, and that site had been remediated by the EPA, and it is now a, um, a golf driving range. Uh, so to look at it, it also was not uh, obvious. But when it came to light, um, the, uh, the final team, the uh, construction management team and the AE, who were in charge of doing the final design and construction, um, actually initiated two phase, a phase one and a phase two study, environmental study. Um, and then ultimately the district, uh, or the city schools team decided to, to, um, to do a third uh, phase three environmental study just to ascertain the current status of the site. 
Uh, and during that study, um, several recommendations came forward as additional um, measures that could be taken to um, further ensure the safety of the students, staff, and community members that might use that site um, for Patterson High School for the next 50 or 60 years. Uh, and so those um, remediation efforts uh, came to uh, be, to, went back to MSA for, uh, to be uh, estimated, and they came forward at $16,505,000 well, 288 uh, roughly. Um, and so that is what we were requesting be added. And that actually allows us to provide, uh, because this is new construction, it is a replacement school. Um, at the time of construction, we can, uh, inst we can uh, design and install a vapor intrusion remediation system underneath this foundation. We can add a very robust um, uh, vapor barrier on the foundation surface itself, and then also uh, we would remove 12 inches of the existing topsoil throughout the play fields and other walking areas on the site and replace it with 12 inches of new topsoil. So the additional cost um, is also involved is the design of those remediation efforts and their installation, also um, the carrying cost for the project for the additional uh, several years. Um, and the project escalation fees. So that is what's being proposed. The rest of the study that I show um, includes the actual, um, and it's not something that you would need to spend any great time on at this time, but doesn't want to. Can we advance the slides, please? Thank you. Um, just to, there was some concern on the part of the community what has happened during uh, the period of time that the uh, project was paused while the study was conducted and uh, the remediation, the efforts that were suggested were examined. Um, and just to, it's there for the community to examine to, to demonstrate that we, that nothing has changed, that the design as it, as it stopped, which was almost at the completion of the construction drawings, has, is unchanged at this point. Um, were all four partners to uh, agree to the additional budget request um, and the project to go forward, uh, that it would pick up and then complete those construction drawings and then construction would then ensue. I'd like to take board questions. Uh, Commissioner Frank. I may, I may have misheard you, so I'm going to ask for clarification. Mm -hmm. you, I thought I heard you say that the estimated remediation costs are roughly $16 million. I, 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 I want to make a distinction between the remediation cost and no, the I'm costs sorry. that are associated with escalation. Yes, And correct. so if, for example, mm -hmm. the district decided to do no, do no additional remediation, which is not being recommended, there mm -hmm. would still be a $10 million escalation charge with that. Not exactly. Okay, can you explain that? Only because um, that $10 million, there's quite a few costs that um, key off of the actual construction costs. So if you take the roughly $6 million in remediation costs right. out of the equation, then there are some trickle-down costs that are in that $10 million. But so that would reduce million, as well. But some of the $10 million, a delay that was, in, it was involved. Some of that would be, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Cannon? Um, how many students will this building hold when when done? Um, just off the top of my head, we, now I can't are remember. Are we expanding I think the footprint? Is it more four, more students than the original? Is it 1,400? So I think the, <clears throat> I believe the number was between 1,200 to 1,400 students. Yeah, I, okay. I don't have the exact number, but I certainly could get that for you. Okay, um, it just it is it is pretty incredible when you look at that number, 111 million dollars for one high school, but that's what high schools cost. Um, uh, I guess my other question is, if this feasibility is approved tonight, can you just go over the timeline on um, when we would expect to break, like the, just the process moving forward? Like what would be the anticipated timeline? So the anticipated timeline would be entirely dependent upon um, the length of time required to achieve the approval on the additional budget request. So if everything went 
sort of forward without you know too much concern or that in fact yeah, let's the, be optimistic like but, <laughs> be optimistic so if everything went through in the quickest possible time frame and we caught all of the board meetings that are still available over the summer um, there's the potential to begin construction again or to, to restart the project in November if in fact um, we don't catch all of those advantageous dates uh, or there's questions for the questions um, and we run into an early winter um, because this involves quite a lot of earthwork um, we would probably be caught and may not be able to restart the actual construction until March so there is some design time and some you know that would have to be allowed and then we would be able to start construction so that would be the two sort of scenarios that we could see at this point in time and just roughly how again how how long do we anticipate it taking to build let's so say we started in november we right. were able to do that how long would it take so we still anticipate that it would take approximately uh, a year and a half to to build to two years mm -hmm. thank you additional questions can I have a motion to approve item 8.01 the visa the revised feasibility study for Patterson Claremont motion from Commissioner Frank second second from Commissioner Canham all in favor commissioners McFadden Bondima Canham Kashani Chinia Frank Berkeley Richardson all opposed Commissioner Hassan Motion passes, 8-1. Thank you. Um, next item that we pulled was uh, item 8.03, the FY18 <coughs> third quarter budget amendment request. Good evening, John Walker, um, Chief Financial Officer. And I'm just going to go through quickly the uh, request for the third quarter budget amendment request uh, for fiscal year 18. Uh, we come back to the board once every quarter and we give a summary of budget amendments that needed to be made in order to, uh, we, we move dollars around as time goes on from the original budget as, um, as additional, uh, additional things come up that we need to, uh, that we need to take care of financially. So what this does is this just gives you by state category and by object of expenditure, the, the dollars that have moved around over the past quarter. And I'll go through those quickly. So that's, the, that's what we do with the budget amendment. Some of the major categories that we did, um, category adjustments in this quarter, where we moved money for uh, the blueprint work and for the fair student funding uh, model review cost. Uh, we also uh, moved, some, moved some dollars for operations um, summer readiness. Um, we did a movement for I, uh, IT identity theft. As you may recall, we had, a, uh, we had an IT issue some time back and we got identity theft protection for our employees that may have been, uh, may have been affected by, uh, by that hack. Also some servers, and we also um, did some additional work on our wireless, um, our wireless initiative to put wireless in all our schools. Uh, the other one is uh, our other county living arrangements uh, funding. We actually moved some money into that. Uh, they, they were the major category amendments that were done in this quarter. What this page shows is, um, it shows you by both schools and central office where the dollars went and where we go. Uh, it shows you where we started with and what it was in quarter one and quarter two and in quarter three and the last one through it shows the, the change for this quarter uh, for those categories. We are required by the state to report all of our expenditures by these state categories. Um, all LEAs in the state uh, are required to, uh, to do this. So we have all of our expenditures are, um, all of our expenditures are categorized in these categories by the state. This is the, the same, but this is a category um, summary for uh, central office. And this is the category uh, summary for the schools for the quarter. The next thing we do is we also, um, 
when we budget, we budget by object of, uh, object of expenditure, salaries, fringe benefits, contractual services, and so forth. And what this just shows is the same information, but it shows it by object of expenditure. And again, you'll see these are some of the major uh, object amendments that were, um, that were done or were, were requesting for the third quarter. This slide shows you uh, for both schools and central where those dollars moved, plus and minus, in those object categories. This next one shows it just the central office piece of what moved. Um, and this last one shows what, show, what moved for the schools for the quarter. And if there are any questions. Thanks, John. Any questions? Okay. I'd like to have a motion to approve the FY18 third quarter budget amendment request. Motion by Commissioner Canham, second. By Commissioner Frank, all in favor? Commissioner Hassan, Bondima, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley, Richardson, all opposed? Abstained? Uh, motion passes 8 0 with one abstention. Next item, um, we don't need a discussion. Um, uh, I want to take a do I have a motion to approve item 9.01, Council of Great City Schools? Uh, moved, by, moved by Commissioner Canham, second. Commissioner Chinia, all in favor? Commissioners McFadden, Bondima, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley, Richardson, all opposed? One abstention? Or <laughs> any, abs abstention. any abstentions? <laughs> Motion passes 8 0 with one abstention. Um, item 9.03, do I have a motion to approve uh, membership dues for MABE? Moved by Commissioner Canham, second by Commissioner Bondima. All in favor? Com Commissioners McFadden, Bondima, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley, Richardson. All opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. Motion passes 8 0 with one abstention. Um, there was one item which did pass by consent. Um, which I've been asked to um, present just because of its uh, interest to the general public. Um, so, Allison, I'm not sure who you want to do this. School calendar. I know, but I just need her to, I want to give her a minute. I don't know if she knows it. She does. She asked me to. I'm just giving her a minute. Um, I'd like to have a presentation on the item 8.05, SY 2018-19 school calendar update. Good evening, Board Chair, uh, Commissioners, and Dr. Santelisis. My name is Sean Conley. I'm the Chief Academic Officer. I'm John Davis, Chief of Schools. So when we're thinking about generating a school year calendar, we have three principles in mind. We, have a, we bring together a cross-functional group that is to ensure that we are following all COMOR rules, such as making sure that we have 180 days of instruction to review and vet SBOs or school-based options. And the third one is actualizing the blueprint, ensuring that we have enough professional learning opportunities for our teachers to improve the instructional practice to ultimately improve the outcomes for our students. I would like to stick with that last point for a second here. Um, with the adoption of a new ELA curriculum coming, there is going to be a great need to ensure that we provide plenty and the right professional learning for our teachers that are grounded in the curriculum. And we've also heard plenty of feedback from the field and also as it's written in the blueprint that we have to make sure that that professional learning is getting directly to our teachers. So our current PD model um, has centered around our cycles of professional learning and our three-year academic goal, which we've shared in the past. By 2020, all students will have access to complex texts and tasks. They'll be able to critically analyze information and be able to develop a coherent evidence-based argument and be able to communicate that with confidence and conviction. 
through the process of the last year and a half of you know, working towards this goal in our cycles of professional learning, we've learned a few things. Uh, some of the good things are uh, we have a clear, audacious goal that the entire school system is working towards. And we also have a common language to wrap around when we support schools and the work here at, with teaching and learning. However, we've also learned some things that we know we, need, we must uh, improve on. Um, uh, we do a lot of our professional learning with our uh, principals and instructional leadership teams, and then we expect them to turn that for their schools. And again, we know that we have to get our professional learning opportunities directly to our teachers. So using that information, uh, I've been working with the chief of schools and thinking through how do we shift or what are the shifts that we need in our professional learning structures to ensure that our teachers are equipped with the uh, instructional practices, the content, the pedagogy to actually uh, ensure that our students are able to be successful academically. Uh, along this journey, um, we have brought together many groups uh, of people to talk through how to improve our, our professional learning. Uh, we have created a PD advisory group that was based on, uh, created, uh, I'm sorry, uh, attended by principals, assistant principals, teacher leaders, and teachers, and we talked about how do we reimagine professional learning in the district. We brought along, we, brought, we talked to uh, the members of our collective learning, and they are members uh, that are responsible for supporting our schools and what's working and what's not working and how do we improve. We also uh, were fortunate enough to have a visit from Aspen Critical Friends, and uh, John and I framed a problem. Overall, we're getting positive feedback from our schools around our professional learning, but as we enter our schools and we're looking for evidence of that, it wasn't consistent enough across schools and even within schools. And from all of that, we learned a few things. Our PD is too top-down. It's not getting directly to our teachers. We need to make sure that our professional learning opportunities are grounded in the curriculum, grounded in the standards, and that all of our professional development should support school-based teaming and planning. The blueprint also provides um, really the right roadmap and explicitly calls out a collaborative culture that we have to have. I think we all know that intuitively, but the blueprint calls that out, along with ensuring that we have an instructional leadership team that really works towards the best professional development within our schools. And then lastly, making sure that we've got not just those teacher teams, but we've got really strong leaders of the collaborative planning sessions and anything that those teachers attend to within the school site. Which leads us to our theory of action, which is really as um, to ensure that we eventually get to student outcomes, we have to ensure that our teachers are expert in standards aligned curriculum, content knowledge, and high leverage evidence based instructional strategies. And to get to that, we have to have school based teams, school based systems that are very high functioning. And ultimately, the teacher development has to be aligned and rooted in standards and curriculum and content knowledge. <laughs> in the end, making sure that what teachers teach next week is literally what they're planning and the time that we're giving them on a week by week basis. So this journey has brought us to four things that we know we have to do differently and better. Uh, we have to make sure that our teachers have access to monthly professional learning opportunities by grade and by content. We want to also include teacher leaders or teacher team facilitators in that process and that experience to make sure that there's individuals at the school level that can support teachers around content, pedagogy, as well as, be, as, well as get developed around how to facilitate teacher teams. The third thing is we want to propose a half day a month uh, to release students to ensure that all schools in the district have, uh, uh, are able to schedule professional learning. And finally, one of the things that I'm really excited about, actually let me pause there on the half day for a second. Um, John and I, I think it was on May 3rd, we just 
put this out there for our principals and instructional leadership teams to kind of gauge what are they thinking, what are they feeling. We all, we knew, we thought we knew that they would be excited by this because the number of SBOs has been increasing over the past few years. And I believe we're at about 75 or 85 schools have asked for SBOs. So we know that schools leaders are asking for more time to do SBOs. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. School-based options. I apologize. I should have did that in the very beginning. Um, <laughs> So we know that principals are looking for more time to develop their teachers. Um, one of the comments at the feedback, well, on May 3rd, right. I describe it as John and I, for the first time in my life, we received standing ovations when we said that we were talking about bringing to Dr. Sanalisis uh, once a month half day professional learning opportunities at the, for the entire district. Right, we were talking about the monthly PD and talking about some of the shifts that Sean has alluded to and the feedback that we had. And when we brought up the half day, literally the rounds of applause and all three sessions we had with principals and instructional leadership teams, um, told us we were on the right track, but also told us we might need to move a little bit quicker and maybe proposing is, you know, putting it nicely. Um, so there was just wonderful feedback around this option. One of the quotes on the, because we try to really uh, dig into the feedback and like make sure we're listening to the field. One of the quotes was, it was refreshing that the CAO acknowledged the need for all schools to have time to meet and plan during a possible half day early release once a month. The idea of structured collaborative planning meetings across the district with outcomes and goals is perfect. So once we realize that, <laughs> Once we realized that there was an interest in identifying ways for more professional learning. <laughs> Is that you, Roger? Yeah, really? Really? It's been Roger. Really? I need you to get your. Um, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> once we knew that there was an interest, um, we had our team start to research. Uh, reach out to some of our partners, whether it's Wallace or uh, the Maryland group that we have around the ELLC, the, work, uh, the working group around ESSA, and think about and find out how are other districts around the country um, identifying and creating more ways or more time for professional learning. And we really came around, we found out about four different ways. Um, one of the things that we're asking about is the half a day uh, release per month, um, or either instead of spreading those professional learning days out across the entire year. Some districts actually put them all together around the halfway point. Um, extended school day as well as the extended school year. So I, we did that on purpose before we actually get into the calendar overview because I just want to be really clear that the professional learning and the need for that and the outlined in the blueprint and the new curriculum and just making sure that our teachers have what they need to be successful for our students, that was driving the way we built out a calendar. So quickly, I'm going to go through the half day early release, systemic professional learning dates, snow day recovery, proposed quarters, parent teacher conferences and holidays. Okay. Um, so we are proposing that there's seven early release days across the year, starting in October and ending in May. And what we would do here is in partnership, the academic office in partnership with the chief of schools, we would use this time for that monthly professional learning that I talked about earlier to ensure that we get that content-based grade level professional learning to each classroom teacher. Um, there are still some things that we need to work on within, within uh, this idea here is what are the opportunities um, that we can create for students if we're going to release early, right? We have to figure out, you know, are there internship options? Are there academic or enrichment options for them? Because we just don't want to release them out into the city. We want to hold them still as much as possible or find creative solutions for them to engage in. And also, just as importantly, we need to ensure that we develop a community communication strategy so that everyone understands what we're doing. Sean, I think we have a couple of questions at this point. I'm going to have Commissioner Canham and then Commissioner Frank. Okay. Can you just talk a little bit, is that school-based or is that system-wide, the half days? And then the monthly all day, is that school-based? I'm, 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 okay. If you could just clarify so, that. So um, we're talking about district-wide for traditional schools. 
And then the second part of your question. So, so literally, on these half days, everybody would come together in, by content um, and or however you organize it. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Gotcha. absolutely. And it's not done within the school. It's, well, our thought is that we would do this virtually to make sure schools have the space and opportunity to put all of their math teachers, all of their literacy teachers by grade level together to learn virtually from, um, again, in partnership with the chief of schools and teaching and learning. So uh, I think a lot of it would be school-based, just to be clear. Um, they would stay in their schools. That's they would exactly stay in their right. schools. Now, there's going to be times when schools want to partner up, and mm -hmm. I've already heard of people talking about that, especially some of our smaller schools. But for the most part, it will be school-based. Which is awesome. Mr. Frank. Thank you. I would just ask as you go through, could you, could you just um, compare this with what exists now or what's changing yes. so we know the proposed okay. changes? So Thanks. what's changing, what's new would be exactly what's right here on this slide is right. this would be very new for us. Right. What is it changing from? Okay. So if we go to the next slide, and it's, um, I struggle with changing on this. So we always have had systemic professional development days and, and we're bound by contract to provide 10 of those. So what we are also thinking about, because I mentioned earlier the blueprint, is if we are able to provide the professional learning for the content for ELA and mathematics on those uh, school-based option or that half a day for teachers, that would allow us to use the professional learning days as a system in a systematic way to engage our blueprint intensive learning sites, whether it's RP, SEL, or literacy. It allows us to go deeper in um, literacy for grades three through five, six and nine. This is also where, and this is now this would be the same, uh, other content areas could have, uh, teachers can get professional learning oppor opportunities on this day, such as our sciences, our social studies, our fine arts. Um, I know I'm missing something, science, if I didn't say that. It also, I think another opportunity here, because we are taking care of some of that learning for teachers on that half a day around the content and pedagogy and looking at data for their students, it provides an opportunity for us to start looking at data in a way that then allows us to provide professional opportunities re with respect to what's happening with the data. So for example, if our three through five, six, and nine teachers are going deeper in literacy as a part of the blueprint during systemic professional development days, we also have data um, that talks about how we are suspending kindergarten and first grade students. So that means that we have adults that we are not wrapping around and supporting and how do I support our young students? We would then provide professional learning opportunities for teachers and staff on these systemic professional de development days based on the, what the data says, what our needs are based on the data. I'm trying to pause. And pa yeah, I want to pause there. I, I, and I want, would add, because you mentioned earlier that there has been a school-based option around. So one, of the, one other thing that this will do is a little more consistency in terms of the entire system yeah. using these, um, yeah. th this option versus maybe 60 schools do and others yeah. don't. And That's I, right. I don't remember the numbers offhand, but I feel like the school-based options went up into the 90s, am I? Yeah. Was it 90s? Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, schools want this, right? I mean, they were wanting it when it was the school-based option. But once you get up to 90 and you get over half the district, and then you get the, the response point? that Sean and I received with principals, I mean, it just makes sense that they want the time with their teachers to prepare accordingly for their kids. What, what's, what's at some point there's a tipping point with this and again it's something that our principals really are looking they want they want time to develop their teachers um, can, can I just say before you went to the implement weather recovery plan um, I just want to publicly commend both Chief Davis and Chief Conley their teams of academic departments ILEDs um, for being willing to break the mold. Um, years and years ago, um, we knew that more job embedded professional development, that we needed more time for that. And it was up to individual schools um, to do that. And I remember teaching in Brooklyn, and it was revolutionary that we took two half days a month and you know, for professional learning and everybody thought we were nuts. Um, but the reality is this is the level of intensity and you all and your teams 
you listen to folks on the ground, which was the other thing. I mean, the fact that you got applause does not surprise me. Um, you listen to the people doing the work. Um, and we know that in order to change practice, you have to give people time to learn. It is part of what is highlighted in the Kerwin Commission. It has been an international standard for improving practice. And here in the United States, particularly in large urban systems, but I would also argue in suburban systems, we continue to operate in an outdated model of one or two professional development days a year, and we wonder why practice does not change. And you two were courageous enough to listen, to actually walk into my office knowing that I could say that you were both nuts, um, and you didn't. Um, and you did it, and it's solid, and it's thought out. So I want to publicly commend you and your teams for pushing the envelope on what um, we need to be doing more of with regards to adult learning. This is the non-sexy part of the work. Everybody wants the newest, flashiest thing. When we know from organizational development research, we know from adult um, learning research, that it takes time, it takes consistency, and that doesn't make the front page news because people say, roll their eyes and say, oh, it's PD again. Um, but the reality is you guys are changing the structure, and I just want to commend you publicly before we get to the weather and inclement weather days. Okay. Which Thank we're going to do quickly. <laughs> yes. Quickly. Because I don't think anybody <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, My fault. I have a comment, a question. How? Um, are related service providers and paraprofessionals, would they potentially be included in, in this PD? So, so I would say paraprofessionals, you know, if they're working in classrooms, they should be working very closely with their teachers and teacher team facilitators because they need to be able to support their students in there as well. Absolutely. So that will be required for them also? Yeah, we'll have to work out. Sometimes they're split between a couple of schools where they would be. But yes, they should be in those conversations the same way as the music teacher should, the same way as the ESL teacher should. They should all be included in there because those are the students that they serve. Okay. Good. And I can go really quick at this point. I just One of the things that I think we've been very thoughtful on is this inclement weather uh, recovery plan. In the past, when we have used up our days, we actually started to take professional development days back to kind of make up that time. And so we tried to be really thoughtful on how to not take the professional learning opportunity days from our staff. And so, um, okay, it's fixed on this slide. Um, so we are proposing the first recovery day as President's Day, February 18th, then the first two days of spring break. And then if there's additional days needed beyond that, they'd be tacked on to the end of the school year. Potentially, we could do up to five days. And you're, we're allowed to go as late as June 21st, or we do have to ask for another waiver? So um, if, if I'm <laughs> correct. Big negatory and, back there. Yeah, yeah if, I, if I'm correct, uh, the legal counsel at the Maryland State Department has said that we can go up to five days beyond without asking uh, for uh, the state oh, board no for permission. <laughs> Uh, that's good. That, I'll just take that as right. the answer. Okay. And then, so, the, the, <laughs> Sean, can you just explain the, the, the recovery days? So that means, I thought we had a certain amount already built into the calendar, but this, this starts as number one. We had one snow day. Like, explain, just take, talk me through, like, we, go, we take this one off. Do you want to jump up? Can you just explain it to me how it goes because taking like it's having the second or third day off of spring break is going to create a ruckus too one that we can justify but i just want to is that what we're saying so jessica wilson director of strategy yeah. and compliance in the cao's office these are the built-in days so the first snow day our recovery plan would be to take president's day second snow day and third snow day would be in spring break and then anything after that would be in those five days so what Sean alluded to was there was a bill that was passed in the General Assembly this year that allows us to go those five days without a waiver. There is still some debate legally as to what that means and what's required. And so right now, the preliminary um, ruling from the AG for the State Board is that we still have to show effort in order to go into those five days. Should that change, we would probably be updating this again to, to reflect the fact that we have those five days on the end that we can use. I, I'm more talking about the second and third day. So right. teachers... You know, they have to, you, we have to, have to communicate this early and often that this, uh, dude. Yeah, so. Yeah. No, I know, but I'm, they're not going to hear it. <laughs> Keep telling them. Well, hello out there. 
plan now. <laughs> enjoy the, enjoy those days off for professional development, and the kids are off because it will take your spring break when it when it snows. And then the final slides are just you know the start dates and end dates for the quarters. I won't stop there. Uh, parent teacher conferences, which is very similar to the way they've been done. We have two parent teacher conference days which are connected to our professional learning days, half days, and then we have two other opportunities where we build a window where schools would identify what day and time would they be their parent conferences in the evening. Um, the proposed holidays, yes, that slide is correct, um, but I won't stop there. And then the next steps, uh, I think, to the commissioner's point is we want to continue with this work group to figure out these half days around what to do with st our students. Um, and how to provide guidance to schools and families and how do we make sure that we have a clear communication plan so that everyone around the city understands or knows. All right, and thanks to uh, Chief of Staff um, Allison for suggesting that we talk about this because it, it, the gravity of it or the, 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 the weight of this is uh, more than I think what could be just communicated by reading a PowerPoint. So thank you very much. First up on the discussion items, um, English language arts curriculum update and recommendation. So you might not need to go through all the context because we've seen some of this. So um, we definitely want to hit the. This is a hot topic, so we definitely want to talk about it, but we don't want to. We don't need to all the. To context. If it's okay, I, I'm going to frame before they get into the sure. presentation just for a couple of minutes. In January of 2017, City Schools announced its three priorities as part of the blueprint for success, and literacy was identified as one of those three areas of focus by our CEO, Dr. Sonia Santelisis. Three of the attributes of the literacy blueprint are ensuring that teachers and students have access to a highly effective, quali qu culturally relevant curriculum that is rigorous and aligned to the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards. Teachers' instructional assessment practices will be guided by research, and these same teachers will consistently engage in learning and reflection about content and pedagogy. The real-life literacy activities that students will experience will help them achieve even beyond their own expectations. These attributes have driven the work of the ac within the academic office, and this past January, we launched a process to identify a new ELA curriculum for city schools. At the onset of this process, we set three goals to achieve. Identify an ELA curriculum that will provide teachers with high quality materials and resources and students with access to a rigorous standard aligned culturally relevant curriculum. We want to make sure that we built the capacity of an ELA curriculum review team to genuinely understand the components of a high quality rigorous standards aligned curriculum and how to identify these same components when reviewing any curriculum during the RFP process. Finally, we wanted to make sure that we engage community parents, school leaders, teachers in a robust way to help inform the final recommendation to our CEO and the Board of Commissioners. To date, we believe that we have accomplished all three of these goals, but we also know that we still have a lot of work to do. On May 8th, we brought to the Board what we believe to be the best two ELA curriculums that are out there right now two curriculums that will provide access to a rigorous, standard-aligned curriculum that will provide um, access to our students for years to come. And quite frankly, it's something that our students don't have access to right now. We intentionally build a cadre of people, including principals, teachers, and district staff, to learn from experts in the field of education, such as David Lieben, Nell Duke, Lisa Delpit, and staff from Ed Reports, to ensure that the review team was prepared to analyze and identify one to two ELA curriculums that will meet the needs of our teachers and students. We offered four engagement sessions to gather feedback on the current curriculum and what we need in the future for our. Uh, for communities and another three engagement sessions just for teachers and school leaders. 
Then we hosted another series of engagement sessions to showcase the top two recommendations for our ELA curriculum. One for school leaders and their ILTs, two for two community sessions, one teacher session, two open houses for teachers, as well as a week-long virtual session. In total, we engaged and gathered feedback from over 500 community members, teachers, and school leaders in this process. I don't want to go too far into the team's presentation, but again, we believe that we have two of the best ELA curriculums out there to choose from. And again, we know we still have a lot of work to do. If, well, we, all, we know that there is no curriculum that is going to do everything we want it to do. If we go with wit and wisdom, we know we need to thoughtfully look at the pacing and our foundations and the word study scope and sequence. If we go with EL, we will need to consider the dramatic changes that would need to incur in our literacy block to support learning labs, as we have learned that our current structures are not aligned to doing the EL curriculum to fidelity. And we also know that we will need to build additional learning opportunities for our students that will allow them to see themselves in the, in the various texts and ex they experience throughout the year but also in the way that our teachers use research-based pedagog pedagogical practices in a culturally relevant way. I just want to end with, or maybe I'm beginning with, um, we will not be ushering forth a final recommendation to the board tonight. Rather, we want to highlight what we have learned and where we'll need to ask for help to ensure we have the best ELA curriculum possible for the students of Baltimore City. So as the team mentions continuing with targeted outreach to school leaders, general and special educators, and district staff, I ask that everyone thinks about their role in supporting this work. I ask that we all lead from our seat and provide genuine feedback when asked, as that will help us make the right decision. Thank you, and I want to now turn it over to our Executive Director uh, of Teaching and Mr. Learning. Mr. Canham. <laughs> Before you begin, um, uh, thank, thank you, Sean. Um, we've, I want, can I give a recommendation, Ms. Lane, Absolutely. as the first of six items up for discussion? Um, um, we've, if we can go to slide, I would recommend you go to slide 12 because the framing of the audit and how we got in here and just that framing was excellent. I think we can go right to the finalists and the proposed implementation strategies and feedback. Sure. If that's okay. That's completely fine. Thank you. No worries. I will review and then just take questions so that way yeah. if I go too fast you can slow me down and go from there. Um, thank you Chief Conley for the introduction. Absolutely what was described around the review process was exactly where we were engaged as well as getting feedback from the field. What you'll see on slide 12 is the actual recommendations of those two top tier curriculum. Um, one open up resources which is EL education and the second is great minds which is wit and wisdom. You'll see, um, and I'll just summarize versus reading the slide for you, that based on the review that we've done, that Ed Reports actually ranks curriculum around three components. One is around standards alignment, the second is around the content knowledge build, and the third is around usability. So that in looking at both of these two top curriculum choices, really they are neck and neck in all of those areas. The area we're going to focus on really closely now is around usability. So you'll see, as Chief Conley identified, that um, both of the curricular are, uh, curriculums are actually developed by teachers. Um, they have been worked on over years and endorsed throughout. You'll see a difference on the left side um, for EL education, that there's an alignment to the NGSS uh, standards for science, as well as the C3 standards for social studies. Um, EL uses an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, for grades K to 2, as Chief Conley talked about, grades K to 2, there is a three-hour literacy block, which means we would need to adjust some of our instructional models um, and pieces that go along with that. Um, and really important to EL is the character development as well as the content knowledge build. Uh, when you look to the right side for wit and wisdom, again, you will see teacher created standards aligned. Um, this is also aligned to modules, what are our current structure that we utilize. Um, one of the differences between Open Up and Wit and Wisdom is that the Open Up EL resources are K5, where Wit and Wisdom is a K8 implementation opportunity. Um, in Wit and Wisdom, you will also see call out for social emotional learning and alignment to the CASEL competencies. 
And then finally, um, a unique feature here is the grounding of the visual arts. So the team did quite a bit of analysis, came back out of the review of 12 that were submitted. These were the top two that we then took on to the public. Um, that was highlighted earlier. We did, thank you to Commissioner Canham, some extended opportunities to really engage folks around this. So we had some virtual opportunities. We had community sessions that we held in the evening. We did some on Saturdays so that we really had teachers, families, community members have full access to the work that we were doing, um, as well as worked with the partners to have PowerPoints available online so that people could really get, walk, get a walkthrough of the materials and a feel for that. Um, you'll see here those different opportunities as well as drop-in hours where we had the material set up here at central office and had people come into that. Um, and it was very interesting because we had, um, as Commissioner, as Chief Conley said, a number of different engagement opportunities. And we even had um, 34 participants who actually did double. So they either did something virtually and then came to a session or they did a drop-in and, you know, provided feedback. We also engaged all of our school leaders during the citywide meeting in May. Mm -hmm. Based on the feedback um, from those groups, from the surveys, from the online documents, you'll see here, again, really kind of an equal opportunity of both strengths and concerns throughout. Um, so for EL education, you will see the strength was really one of the play-based opportunities that people saw for the early learning opportunity. Um, the integrated phonics component, project-based learning opportunity, and again, call out to the social and emotional work there. I'll compare the strengths to wit and wisdom and then come back and talk through the concerns. Strengths here were really the alignment to what is currently in the instructional model. Also, the high-quality, high cultural, relevant texts and um, the engagement of using art as text so that students are looking at paintings, speeches, et cetera, grounded in the arts. Um, the opportunity to build founda um, foundations, excuse me, to continue as the phonics program. So Wit and Wisdom uses foundations as their core phonics, which we currently use in city schools K-3. Um, feedback that also came from the field was the opportunity for K-8 structure. So really looking at the coherence from grades K across grade 8 and instructional routines and strategies. Um, also the call out to social emotional learning there as well. Concerns that came from the feedback, um, again, if we start with EL, what I mentioned earlier around the three-hour ELA block, there was concern around if we do three hours of a block of time, when would we have time for science and social studies, knowing that there's alignment to those content areas, but it's not actually teaching the science skills and strategies. Uh, teacher planning materials, uh, one of the feedback pieces that we did earlier in the audit slides that set context is really talking about teachers wanted things to be really controlled and concise for them, uh, that these materials actually have a number of guides that go with each of the sections. So there's a word study block, there's a lab block, and then there's what they call a content block, and each of those has materials for teachers to prep around. Um, and you'll see that referenced in the last block. Of course, planning is going to take place in either one of the curriculum choices, but the feedback here was that teachers felt that it was a very dense curriculum for them to work through. Concerns, again, if we look to wit and wisdom, there were concerns from folks around continuing with foundations as the core phonics program. And if we do continue with foundations, what are we going to do around professional development or the scope and sequence to really help teachers better understand how to implement with students, um, especially around pacing? Uh, the complexity and rigor of the texts, while people called out the high quality, they also talked around the rigor and the tough levels that students will have to engage with throughout. Um, and it does not appear to be as K2 friendly, meaning that the play-based opportunity wasn't there that they noticed. So you'll see where the team has been now and where we're continuing to collect feedback is a really um, consideration around that usage piece. Because again, as I, as I described, the two curricular, or curriculum, excuse me, are really top notch. Um, you'll see here readiness for district-wide implementation. So thinking about EL, I really talked about that already. What are the needs for the instructional work that needs to happen in the block, as well as the pedagogical shift to the work around project-based learning. For wit and wisdom, there is a better alignment for city schools instructional model, and it also provides a familiarity for teachers where they would be using um, foundations as their core and following the instructional model. 
Professional development, you'll see really are side by side. There are, you know, a heavy lift that we're going to have to do ongoing to both initiate teachers as well as ongoing support for teachers and school leaders, district office staff in this work. The educative features is a piece where we really spent time looking at how the materials are organized what supports are available within the curriculum to help teachers um, to support them in decision making with students that may have special needs el students etc you'll see that um, again a call out came here for el around multiple resources with significant time for teacher planning um, where you see for wit and wisdom embedded resources that develop instructional practice and develop content knowledge across the grades both within a grade and across grade levels um, also around cultural relevance, I think Chief Conley highlighted this point, both got equal feedback around the cultural relevant texts that are involved, um, and both would take time for us to go back in and revisit around the context of Baltimore. So some of the things we want to celebrate in the history for our students around both the his history they've been engaged in and the potential that they have in the work and in their um, lives in Baltimore. Um, each would take curriculum enhancements that we would need to build out that would happen in teaching and learning along with feedback from teachers and school leaders within this process. So you'll look again to the left on EL. You'll see that building these additional resources for students that we've identified as our continuum of learners, so students with disabilities, gifted and advanced learning, English language learners, you'll see that's the same for both Wit and Wisdom and um, EL. For EL, if we adopted and recommend EL, it would be a K-5 implementation, and the audit actually recommends that we do an adoption in K-8. So if we adopted EL, we would have to do revisions to 6-8 to um, make sure that we address the deficits that were identified in the audit. Similar to the right side, as I said, you'll see that continuum of learners build out resource. But you'll also see what I said earlier around foundations. We would need to revise the scope and sequence of that document, as well as um, keep the professional development re-energized around that work, and then um, revise remaining curriculum based on the audit feedback for 9 through 12. Last little home stretch here, you will see the opportunities for alignment for the content areas. So again, I highlighted for EL that you see an interdisciplinary approach that calls out alignment to NGSS and C3. You'll see for great minds, the reinforcement of close reading and you'll see the visual and cultural literacy that focuses on the visual arts integration. And then you'll see parent resources identified where in EL there will be the opportunity for module letters that provide an overview for families. In Wit and Wisdom, you will see that there are module overviews with additional fluency homework, extension activities, and sample questions to support students in the learning of the module and the topic that they're doing. And then finally, coherence and the knowledge build across grade levels. So that you'll see in EL for K-5 that you're providing a coherent foundation for grades K through 5. That really goes back to that point that Chief Conley hit earlier that creates the equitable access for all students. And then finally looking at wit and wisdom, you will see that that same thing happens, but it would be actually for grades K through 8 so that you could see the feedback around that. Um, as you can see, the team has really spent a lot of time, not only the curriculum review team, but gathering the feedback from others. Um, as I said, the two are neck and neck around those two aspects of content knowledge build, as well as, um, um, excuse me, the content knowledge build and the standards alignment. Where I would say we're getting feedback from the field that we want to continue is that wit and wisdom is a little bit in front around the um, usability. So that right now what we're hearing from the field is that folks, teachers, um, as well as school leaders are seeing a little more of the usability around wit and wisdom. What we want to do is go out knowing that both of the curriculum are so close in what they're aligning is getting additional feedback. You'll see that on the next slide. Um, that, uh, that feedback will inform us bringing information back to you on June the 26th for a vote. Um, you'll see the implementation support that we've identified in the middle um, bucket there talking about digital resources for teachers to plan over the summer. 
um, training institutes that we would have for school leaders and for teachers. Uh, we're offering two weeks of those time, may offer a third that you'll see July 16th through the 18th as well as August 6th through the 8th where we would encourage all of our teachers to attend. Um, we would encourage our school leaders to attend as well. The district is working to purchase and procure those items once we know the final vote on the 26th. Um, and then there would be the ongoing professional development again for all stakeholders. So we want to make sure that we have teachers involved in that process, school leaders, um, district office staff. We've also been spending quite a bit of time, um, Ashley Cook, who is our newer director of literacy, who is um, at UDLN at a training right now. We've been spending quite a bit of time thinking about how do we keep the ongoing feedback. We're really excited. I'm super proud of the team for the way they've garnered feedback from folks. So how do we keep that going throughout the year? So really creating structures where we can bring teachers together, school leaders, et cetera. Um, and then finally, those curriculum enhancements that I highlighted throughout, building the guidance and resource for those uh, continuum of learners that may need additional support, collaboration with our district partners and teachers to build out that cultural relevance piece that we heard so um, clearly from the field around being important from the stakeholders and really thinking about that revision of the audit feedback on the 6 through um, six through 12 or 9 through 12 based on where we're going. So our goal in conclusion is really to continue those conversations over the next couple of weeks so that we make sure we've heard from all stakeholders. One example of that is that we want to pull together our special um, education um, self-contained classroom teachers to really think about what is the guidance that they see within both of the curriculum choices here, how can they help inform the work that the literacy team is doing. I think another connection to what um, both Chief Conley and Chief Davis referred to earlier around the professional development is the great opportunity that this provides us to bring these folks together as leaders in their work, but also to do the training with teachers ongoing and create cadres of support. So that's where we are. Happy to take questions. Mr. Hassan. Thank you. Um, lots and lots of work. Kudos to the team. Uh, being that, that we have pre-K programs and that the state has a motivation seeming to grow pre-K programs, do one or the other of these lend themselves to back mapping so we have a consistent growth? Yes. So we've been working with, um, as Chief Conley said, Nell Duke has been someone who's been providing feedback and guidance to the group, and she is actually a person who is working on the pre-K curriculum with MSDE. So I would say that they both have alignment. What we're really looking at is how that content knowledge builds. So until those are released, we won't know um, the full scope and sequence of those. But we've been talking to MSDE about a release of those for us to review. Uh, and then my second question is, um, have either of these been crosswalked with WIDA? Um, that's a great question. We can follow up directly with, um, with our English language team. They both have assessment components that go with them that are formative within, but I'm not sure if they've been crosswalked with WIDA, but happy to check that. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Frank. That was a very impressive uh, presentation, and um, I have to confess a certain lack of understanding of how curriculum works and how it actually makes its way into the classroom. So this is a question that's sort of born in that ignorance of how the curriculum actually makes its way into the teacher's classroom. So to what degree or do you evaluate the degree to which the teacher brings his or her own creativity, flexibility, <laughs> ideas, experience to the curriculum and to the student? And is that something that's measured? And of these two alternatives, does one allow that more than the other? Do we want to encourage that or do we want to see more uniformity? How, is, how are those things reflected in curriculum? That's a great question. In both of the curriculum examples that you see um, that we've brought forward, both of them create vignettes for teachers um, versus a script for teachers. So that we want to ensure that teachers have the supports that they need in order to get done what needs to happen every day with their students. That's part of that educative feature piece around what's happening in the curriculum. I'll respond and then Sean let you jump in. Um, that I think the other piece of what we're doing is when you have an adoption of a new curriculum, part of it is around the fidelity of what's happening to that. And when I use fidelity, I use that as a good word, not as the 
as the fidelity force arm, right? Um, but the idea of we're never going to know if we really impact our students or what was the lever that impacted that if we have people trying different things all over. So we want to bring cohesion. That's the real reason we want it to not only get the voices that we heard, but we want to do the continued outreach to make sure that people understand what is in the curriculum and then where the teacher decision making happens. We definitely prioritize teacher decision making and that teachers know their students best and know what happens every day based on the data that happens with their students, you know, the different collection they're doing with student data checking in, whether it's a day-to-day -day check in or a weekly check in to make decisions around that. So it is super important for us to hear from teachers ongoing within this. Um, and I'll just share, it was interesting, some people who were at the Teaching and Learning Board Committee, one of our <coughs> teachers who was on the review team actually shared um, that when she came to this process, she was like, we don't need either one of these. We can write our own curriculum. And after the review and being engaged in the review, she was like, never mind, we can't do it the way it's done here, just around the cohesive nature. But that they absolutely saw opportunities where you can differentiate based on your interest, your learning. So we would, you know, in our professional development would encourage making sure that teachers understand the foundation, the design of the curriculum the intention of the curriculum, but it's also a fine line in how do you make sure that you're doing that while still allowing that creativity. To that, uh, Ms. Lane, besides the, um, the nice half-day PD sessions that we'll be um, working on, will there be support opportunities throughout the year for uh, teachers to continue to grapple with this outside of uh, the what is it the three-day summer correct um, and is that literacy institute is it just focused on the ela curriculum sure so i can answer that mm -hmm. um both both questions i think the first part of your question is there will be definitely ongoing opportunities throughout so the sbo days that you heard about are those half days would be opportunities but we also have our systemic professional development as well as opportunities where we're going to be hosting open house evenings where teachers can come in and get support based upon grade levels. Um, there's also, when you're doing an implementation of this size with a new curriculum, there's also professional development that will be pushed to schools. Um, and by that, I mean that coaches will be available to go into schools from the vendor, from the partner, in working with the literacy team to determine what are those ongoing needs, um, which is another reason to continue to get that feedback as we work together. Um, your second part of your question, I just forgot. What did you say? Sorry. Oh, perfect. Yes, thank you. The three days of the Summer Institute, depending upon which way we go, will be incorporated not on the it's getting late, right? Not only the, the well, not only the literacy work, but the data work that happens around that. Um, you know, if we're making shifts and adjustments within our assessments, again, depending upon where we go with which curriculum choice. If we went with wit and wisdom, it would include an opportunity to reground folks with foundations and that work around um, with foundations. Excuse me, around the work around phonemic awareness and phonics and the word study piece, et cetera. So it would be a comprehensive support. And our goal is once we can name what, once we, you know, finalize what the curriculum choice is, we'll also work with the vendor to have a day for principals so that there'll be a session for school leaders focused on leadership within the curriculum. Either one that we choose will still have to do a revision uh, to either middle school and high school or just high school. What does that process actually look, look like? Um, and will it be... What does it look like? Sure. So it will be taking the feedback that we got from the audit and the recommendations from the team. Um, again, based on what decision we make, we have some decisions to make in leadership around are we going to adopt 9-12 the next year? Are we going to adopt 6-12 the next year, depending upon where we play into that? So we'll want to make some revisions that are strategic and also cost effective. We don't want to go out and put all new text in middle grades and then come back and say, well, next year we're really going to update that to something different. So um, some of the audit findings we found that are posted that we can walk through later again are the pieces around alignment. Um, 
to texts and tasks. So what are we asking students to do and what happens across those grade levels? I'll just use six through eight as an example um, to really think about that so we could go in and revise some of the questions and tasks versus purchasing new books and making new decisions around that. Um, so when we get the final decision made um, and voted on and approved by the board, then we'll be able to take that information and start that work. Um, you know, the team has already been debriefed, so the literacy team, again, getting input from teachers and school leaders throughout that process would be pulling together and determining those next steps. So they've all been, they've been debriefed around the findings of the audit, what have we learned, et cetera. I think it's brilliant, uh, Janice, and I appreciate that. And I think that some of the buy-in that we'll get from the community in the culturally relevant uh, curriculum development and just it being relevant, period, um, to get them involved in that revision process um, for 9 through 12 or 6 through 8, um, because that gives them that opportunity to continue to help shape while we're working out um, the kinks to this curriculum, which we know will have its um, flaws as we are working through them, just like every curriculum That's will right. have as, as it is being pushed out. Um, but I think that that would be a, something brilliant. And just kudos to the work that you are leading and, and with the chief and with everyone on the staff. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our team has done an amazing job. Commissioner Hassan? So one just sort of follow-up question. We've talked a lot about teachers and a lot about teacher professional development. How, and this maybe is for Dr. Sandalisa or, or for Chief Connolly, how does this intersect with principal autonomy? Does every school have to adopt what the district adopts? I'll turn my mic off and let you two take that one. There you go. <laughs> So um, I believe that this adoption is really important because the curriculum audit has made it very clear that our students do not have access to what they should have access to. And so I think it's really important that this is adopted across the school system, at least with traditional schools. Um, I do believe that there probably are some situations where schools are already having success within their program, and I think we want to take those as a case by case to make sure that there is a plan in place if they are not fully doing something like this. But in my mind, I would love for this to be across the entire district. I just love when we get questions that we haven't had time to. Um, <laughs> and I'm looking at Chief Davis, who's like, if you want to take a mic, feel free. Um, so, so I sat with, I'm going to answer this way, that, that I sat with a group of teachers, um, actually African American teachers, who just wanted to talk to me about um, their experiences in the district. and. The, you know, a, a number of them asked me very directly, like, why can't, because of the concern around cultural relevance, and um, as you heard tonight, we are working on that. Both of these sets of curriculum materials, we've gotten good feedback from teachers that actually they are more culturally relevant than they thought they would be. Um, but they pushed and they said, well, why can't we just all design, right, our own curriculum in addition to it just being hard? And one of the things that I said to them that I will say to answer that question um, is if we are looking at the needs of young people in Baltimore City, we have large numbers of young people who move three to four times a year, who are literally in different schools in September, November, March, and May. We also know that young people who experience a break in reading instruction, particularly in those early years, where I go to one school and they want to teach it this way, and I go to another school and they want to teach it this way, are more vulnerable to have, to, to not be able to read well. And so what, what I would say on that, which does dovetail with, with Chief Conley, is Let's look at what the needs of the kids are, not what adults want, right, to have freedom to do. And I think one of the things that, that, that the team has proven in this process is that we are leaving space for teacher design. We are working on a Baltimore City um, history and identity unit that will be developed by 
Baltimore City public school teachers with other consultants, right, that, that pertains to our kids and our relevance. But we need a foundational, backbone, common curricula that is consistent. And, you know, we know that we, you know, families have choice with charter schools, and charter schools will continue to have, that have autonomy. But, but I believe that based on the work that the team has done, and I will say this, and I said this as, as CAO, and I know Chief Conley also has a, has a similar ethic, a, a school that does not want to go with this is going to have to do serious, serious case making about the strength of their own set of materials. And we have heard overwhelmingly from the field, overwhelmingly from teachers, from principals, we want a constant. We want a backbone, right? <laughs> yes, we want to be able, and we will allow those creative expressions. And the, the creativity comes in the teaching of the materials. But we cannot put young people at risk with high mobility rates to our desire to have customizable kinds of curriculum. And, and we will, like I said, we will have those units. We got a group of teachers that are working on these units. We're gonna have specialized units for high school. There will be plenty of that. But this has got to be the backbone because we have a high mobility rate and to continue to put young people at risk for reading failure because we just want something to look different from school to school is an adult-driven decision. So, yes, is there always an opening for someone to pitch their case? Sure. But the general agreement, and, and Chief Conley asked me this a long time ago, is we, we are going with, this is the backbone. This is the backbone. This is the commonality. We will learn together what the weak spots are. We will address together what the weak spots are. But, but this need is for kids. And, and that's what happens. And I, and I have watched and looked in the faces of young people who are going through stuff at home. They are just beginning to master to read. They have to move because they are housing vulnerable. And they walk into a classroom with a totally different set of materials, a totally different frame. And we're asking them to adjust because we want to say what we want. And the time to do that is now. And it will always be for feedback, but we have got to reframe what the starting point is. So yes, that's a long-winded way of saying, and I want you to know, when I said this to that group of teachers who were passionate about wanting these other spaces, I got no pushback. They all understood. And they all said, for the good of the kids, we get it. We just want to be part of this other development. But for the good of kids, we can't have idiosyncratic curriculum. We just cannot. It, it, is, it is making our kids vulnerable, and, and it's not right. And so, yes, this is the backbone. We welcome everybody. If you're a teacher that's listening, you want to be part of the unit development that other teachers are doing this summer, contact Janice Lane. Emails up there. Emails up there. We welcome you. But we have got to have a common backbone. It's not going to be perfect. We're going to work on it. But I cannot, and, and Chief Conley and I talked about this, and, and you know, well, Chief Davis is gone on record earlier about this, so he doesn't have any ethical conflict. But, but we have got to be able to provide that stability. That is our responsibility as educators and it's our responsibility as adults. So yes. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was the right answer. And verbosity, right? Mr. Frank? I, I agree with everything I you to go said. First. I, wanna, I just want to ask you, I think you may have limited yourself, and I want to ask the question by by using the mobility, you know, as the primary reason that we want to have a cohesion across the district, I imagine there's evidence to suggest in the reasons that you and, right. and the chiefs believe that there are, there are other reasons to have that cohesion. And it's not just the fact that we have mobility yes. across no, the district. I, no, you're, no you're, abs you're absolutely right. And, and, well, and some of that is that you want teachers to be able to have the conversations about the teaching. When we talked to Lisa Delpit about this, right, and we were asking her, and Chief Conley, you correct me if I'm wrong, one of Lisa Delpit's reflections was, whatever curriculum you get, culturally responsive teaching is about the teaching. And so if you have people trying to design different 
curriculum every other day, you know, or, or once a month, you don't get time to get really good at teaching. And with Teresa Perry, who is the author of Like to be Young, Gifted, and Black, and I was early in my career in Boston, one of the things she said to me is she said, concentrate on getting good teaching. You will have time to have input to the adjustments. You will have time if you want to be specialized in curriculum development. We need people to focus on the teaching. We need people to have some consistency. And it is in the teaching of it that the brilliance of what we saw this evening with our Teachers of the Year comes forth. And, and so it's, we're, not, we're not shackling anybody. We're not implementing this in a rote manner, but we are saying, that, 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 that being focused on the teaching and what it means is worthy of that kind of effort. And it is hard to teach. It is hard. It is hard when you are dealing with all of the challenges our young people are coming with. And so there are advantages to, to, to being able to learn across <clears throat> schools because we're using the same materials. And so what Chief Conley learned as opposed to Chief Davis, and we are sitting in a teacher group, we get a different ability to share and we don't we aren't serving just 712 kids in a niche one school right that runs k-12 to and i think it's wonderful and i have amazing colleagues who teach in those settings and it's fabulous and great for them but for us we have to be able to have shared conversations across an entire district and that's and it, and it maximizes the time that the team took to carve out that learning. So yes, it's not just about mobility, but it is about professional conversation. It is about where will you put your emphasis in teaching, and it will be do we have a common backbone out of which all of the creativity is, is grounded. So yes, and I wasn't going to say that other part, but you asked. So. And I, can I just add one point to that, Please, too? I think right the in. other pieces in working with the other experts we've talked to around working with Lisa Hansel and some of those folks is also looking at the strategic content build that has to happen. Yes. So Thank that you, creating Chris. gaps for Thank students you. is really um, something that happens a lot because what, what they learn in K is actually building on to first grade, on to second grade, and on moving forward, um, which again, I think is, is something that schools are grappling with right now around K-5, what do you do six, eight, or do we go K-8 and you have that coherence? But again, it opens up those opportunities that create gaps for students if they're not learning and we're taking access away from them. So that also, that's really important in the curriculum that we don't want people to say, well, I didn't really like that unit. I'm going to skip it. And they don't realize that they need that as the foundation for third grade years later. If, if I could, can I also add the, the parent side of that or the support side of that? Have, you know, and I'll go back to the movement, but if you're the parent uh, and you're moving, it, the difficulty in trying to help your child, um, if you're going through three or four or five different programs versus sort of the, you know, the, the there's some ease and, and, and some um, positive feelings about having to go to a new school when you know that there's something about that new place that will be familiar for you. Great. So I think that's, a, I say amen to everything you've been doing, but thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Sure. Next up, um, really small topic. <laughs> the 2018 Comprehensive Educational Facilities Master Plan, also known as the CEFMP. Good evening, Commissioners and Dr. Chantelisis. Tonight, I'm Nicole Stewart. I'm the Director of Facilities Planning. And tonight, I'll be presenting the 2018 Comprehensive Educational Facilities Master Plan, otherwise known as the CEFMP. Every year, City Schools is required to submit to the state on July 1st, this uh, CEFMP. And most importantly, uh, this document represents uh, it is a repository of uh, facilities related data and other district data. Also, it is one of the district's most important tools for how we communicate about uh, what's going on in the district. So whether or not there are programmatic changes, uh, portfolio changes, this is one of our main tools for how we communicate with the public. 
about what's going on in the district. So this slide is just a snapshot of the different components of the CEFMP, but I just want to emphasize that um, uh, if this document requires an immense amount of collaboration within the facilities department and across other departments in the district uh, over a course of several months that then gets distilled down into um, this, what will be tonight a brief presentation. I just want to to acknowledge my staff and uh, also our executive director, uh, Dr. Washington, who uh, provides the support as we uh, work to produce this document over many months. So in terms of what's in the CEFMP, uh, very briefly, uh, one of the things that facility planning uh, coordinates every year is uh, the movement of our citywide programs. And so that information is contained here in the CEFMP as well as other uh, programmatic changes that happen within a year. We also uh, provide quite a bit of demographic data analysis as well as the student, uh, student tenure enrollment projections are contained in the CEFMP. In addition, our utilization plan is included in the CEFMP every year. So what's new for the 2018 CEFMP? Tonight I'll talk a little bit about uh, the expansion of the equity mapping we've been doing over the last couple of years. And so what was previously a section in the CEFMP will now be a full chapter. Uh, just in the context of some of the conversations that have been happening over the past few months around enrollment, uh, we will be um, in this presentation uh, presenting some of the data that's included in the CFMP that in previous years doesn't necessarily make it to this presentation, but some of the, in the, within the context of uh, our enrollment decline, just uh, presenting a little bit of context uh, around our enrollment uh, trend factors and some analyses that we do. And uh, just to address a point earlier, yes, we, uh, the Facilities Planning Office has collaborated with uh, the Enrollment Task Force as well as the Office of Achievement and Accountability uh, to provide uh, this and other data for the task force effort. In addition, tonight I'll talk through some of the implications of enrollment on our district utilization and just uh, briefly talk about how we plan some of the tools we're developing in order to uh, have this data be more accessible to the public. So about a year and a half ago, uh, we developed and have since been using what we've been calling the Community Conditions Index. So it is an index that takes into consideration uh, three areas of equity, access, disparity, and neighborhood stability, and then the six community indicators related to those areas. Uh, and what we've been doing is uh, using the Community Conditions Index to basically get a better understanding of the distribution of our facility investments and our uh, program uh, locations across the district, and the distribution of our programs across the district. This year, as I said, we'll be expanding the equity mapping uh, with a uh, focus on the blueprint areas. So the map you see here is just a map of the intensive learning sites and the different by type across that community conditions index uh, to see how those programs are distributed across neighborhoods with different varying levels of uh, investment across the district. And what will be, and as an example, just to connect this to some of the work that um, was presented early tonight. So as an example, we'll be um, looking at some community indicators as well as some of the neighborhood assets and interventions and looking at them through the context of the um, blueprint work. So as an example, oh, we just saw a presentation on liter literacy and this isn't an exhaustive list at all, but what we'll be doing is looking at um, sort of some data around current conditions. So we want to know how many kids uh, by neighborhood have library cards. We want to know where libraries are located. We want to know some of the uh, assets and interventions that the district has. So where are our library and uh, media centers, our most recent library and media centers in partnership with the Weinberg uh, Foundation? Where are the reading partner programs located? So those are some of the kinds of things that we'll be doing on, uh, in relation to the three areas, the three blueprint areas. 
Right. So uh, enrollment trends. So as you all are aware, we uh, experienced our third consecutive year of decreasing enrollment. We uh, hit a, our most recent peak was in school year 14-15, and since then we've experienced this, a three-year decline. Um, so we talked about that a lot. Uh, I wanted to include in this presentation uh, just some of the other factors that impact uh, our enrollment uh, just to provide some context for what is happening, some of the trends that are happening across the city that are then impacting our enrollment. So population trends. So uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the census released its annual population estimates. Uh, there was quite a bit of attention around the fact that we have in the last two years uh, decreased about 5,000 or more people over um, one year. The overall city population has decreased. And what I wanted to emphasize in relation to how this then impacts us is even that, five, that number, that 5,300 population decrease that received a lot of media attention and discussion around, well, is this actually, actually true in relation to what we know about permits and what's happening in housing? There was some discussion around some of our stakeholders in the city. I think it's important to recognize that even that number is a net population loss. So that takes into consideration births, deaths, and migrations. If we just looked at the residents who are uh, coming into Baltimore from other states and leaving Baltimore uh, to go to other states, that number is about 9,200 in terms of what that population change is over the one year. Uh, so this map, uh, we actually include every year within the CEFMP, we do this uh, neighborhood analysis where we're looking at different indicators across uh, different neighborhoods. So this is just a snapshot of the uh, neighborhood population change uh, using census and American Community Survey data. So as you can see, we're seeing in the darker areas represent uh, areas where we're experiencing at least 2% uh, growth in population. So as you can see, those areas are those around the water, around uh, the border with Baltimore County and then also in Northwest Baltimore along sort of some of our major thoroughfares. So those are the areas experiencing uh, much of the uh, growth within the city. And then uh, North Baltimore, we, know, we can see that those areas are relatively stable. And then the areas in East, West, and some in South Baltimore are experiencing overall population uh, declines. And uh, overall, again, in context with what we're interested in, families and children, uh, there's been about a 12% decrease since 2010 in uh, families with children in the city. So then how does that relate to our enrollment changes? So uh, we can see, so the darker areas here, so this data is uh, our 17, 18 enrollment based on where students live across the district. So the darker areas represent those where our highest concentration of students live. So that would be uh, West Baltimore, some in Northeast Baltimore, and then in South Baltimore. So those are the areas where we're seeing the largest concentrations. And of course, and then we can see in Northeast Baltimore where uh, those are the areas with the fewest uh, students who are enrolled in city schools. And so then what's overlaid on that is then the changes and the number of students living in those neighborhoods who are enrolled in city schools. So the areas with the red outline are those that um, are experiencing the most decline. And so it follows that if those are the areas with the highest concentrations, then those are likely the areas with the highest um, uh, losses. But then I also want to emphasize that in terms of the neighborhoods that are outlined in green and experiencing some increases, it's very, uh, small increases, and they are relatively flat. They're, I believe only the Orangeville neighborhood has a significant increase from school year 14, 15 to this school year. And just to touch on a point uh, that was made earlier, so this presentation is actually the abridged version. And so within the um, appendix and also in the uh, uh, CEFMP this year, 
uh, we have some additional data and one of those data items are how many kids are attending um, uh, non-public schools. So that number is about 13,000 students and where those numbers are derived from every year. Uh, MSDE produces a report of non-public education uh, by county, by LEA. And so in 17-18, that number was about 13 students who reside in Baltimore who attend non-public schools. Just for the sake of comparison, uh, you have counties like Baltimore County where the number is about 27,000 and Montgomery County, it's about 30,000 students not attending public school. In addition, that number is um, uh, confirmed by second source when we look at American Community Survey data. Uh, that is also uh, the estimation of the number of students or children living in Baltimore City who don't attend public schools. And uh, this slide just gets into uh, the enrollment patterns by housing market. So the Baltimore Planning Department has a housing market typology. Uh, so some of the, the first three listed regional choice, middle market choice, so those are our more stable housing markets in, uh, across the city. So they're the purple and darker blue areas. So that means they have a high median uh, um, home sales. They have high rates of home ownership. And then on the other end of the spectrum are the areas that are considered stressed. So these are areas with high rates of vacancies, um, high mobility, high uh, rental rates for residents. And so what we did was uh, look at some of the, those changes in enrollment based on this housing market typology. And so if you look at the total distribution of uh, students, so in those first three housing markets, that's a, that represents about 25% of all of our students. That middle three represents about 50% of our students in 1718. And then about 25% of our students live in stressed communities. And what we did was look at what the change is, well, what the change was over one year for just those K to five students. And as you can see, um, the majority of losses we've been experiencing is in those stressed uh, neighborhoods where you're seeing a lot of um, uh, change in neighborhoods in terms of uh, you know, increased vacancy or just other housing market changes that are going on in those areas. And so this is just a snapshot of the 2014 housing market typology. The city updates their housing market typology every three years. We'll be getting a new one very soon. And so while this represents just a snapshot, what we're working on um, in collaboration with uh, the city uh, Department of Planning, as well as researchers from Johns Hopkins University, we were awarded a 21st Century Cities Initiative uh, C grant uh, in order to develop um, and look at a longitudinal study of the relationship between the housing market and school enrollment. So we'll be able to look at not just that snapshot of the one year of um, the housing market typology, that changes over time. So we'll be able to look at in the past, the previous housing market typologies and the new one this year, in addition to some of the other demographic and school changes across the district to try to understand that intersection. And the idea is that um, as we uh, develop uh, this intersection of these different factors, that, that will help to um, or connect with the things that are going to come out of the enrollment task force. So we'll have a way to identify different neighborhoods with specific challenges and then apply some of those strategies uh, to different neighborhoods. So the enrollment projections. Um, so of course, so all of that was to say there are a lot of things that are happening across the city that impact our enrollment uh, that then impacts our enrollment projections. So we're required to uh, submit 10 years of enrollment projections to the state and our methodology, we use a grade progression ratio, which is the standard methodology across various um, school districts. But for this particular year, the, we're experiencing uh, significant uh, decreases in the enrollment projections because our methodology is based on a three-year trend and we know that we've experienced declines in those uh, three-year trends. So the, initial trend looked extremely dramatic, but we believe that those projections were much lower than what we expect to actually happen in the district. And uh, 
what we've done this year is, and we did the same last year, is a plot factor to account for some of the policies uh, that we are uh, implementing around enrollment, uh, some of the work that continue that we continue to do, as well as some of our partnerships that we have with uh, the Baltimore Teachers Union uh, and the Enrollment Task Force work. Uh, so those are the kinds of things we consider in order to apply this factor that when we do that work, we expect the projections to not be as dramatic as they had, they would have been had we not applied them. And these are just some of those policies uh, and initiatives. So the geographic realignment of pre-K offerings, uh, some of the middle grade strategy work, as I said, the task force, and um, re-engaging students in the partnership with the mayor. So this is just a snapshot of how the enrollment projections have changed over time. So that top green line is what the projections look like in 15-16. Uh, and this is just to demonstrate that as we continue to uh, decrease, that those projections every year for the same year has declined. And then that definitely connects to our uh, the utilization of our buildings. So as you know, as part of the MOU uh, between city schools and our partners for the 21st century buildings plan, we are required to hit certain targets with our utilization. So we met the intermediate target in school year 15, 16 of having an 80% utilization, uh, not counting our swing spaces. The final target, was intended to be 86%. Uh, we know that based on uh, the change in construction schedules that uh, and some of the enrollment uh, challenges that we faced, that that target date uh, at this time we're in conversation with some of our partners in the state to discuss how we review and potentially revise those utilization targets. So this slide is just a snapshot of what that current utilization uh, looks like for buildings that are in our portfolio. We're currently at 83% uh, utilization. Uh, and when you look at uh, the counts of students, the counts of buildings that are underutilized or what meaning have utilizations below 65% and overutilized, uh, this gives a little bit more detail so we can have about an understanding. So when we say we have underutilized buildings, what does that actually mean? And so this slide just actually lists out the buildings in 1718 that are underutilized and gives some explanation for some of the other things we should consider as we think about what, what these underutilized buildings are. Uh, so some of them are being impacted by 21st century. Some of them have programs with entrance criteria. Some of them are housing charter schools with enrollment caps. And also um, some of them uh, have other, we're using them for other district purposes. And in terms of some of the other highlights on this slide, uh, based on these numbers for school year 17, 18, we have about 3,500 excess seats across the district. So when we think about, and that's in terms of our 86% utilization target. So in order to hit our 86% utilization target, based on these, the numbers for this year, it's about 3,500 seats. Uh, based on the fact that enrollment is, will likely continue to decrease over the next few years, we expect that utilization to uh, decrease even though we are continuing to uh, close schools. And so that's On what this. Slide, I'm sorry. Slide 17. Is there a reason why we omitted the names of this, the elementary, the ES pre K through eight buildings there? Not intentionally. I think some of the folks. So in context, uh, most of our. Um, our excess seats are within middle and high school buildings. And so when you look at the table above it, you can see, uh, you know, the elementary buildings have a utilization of about 98%. But when you're looking at middle and high school, it's a range of 40 to 70. So a lot when we talk about these excess numbers, we oftentimes talk about them in context of those buildings. So this slide just explains uh, that challenge that I just described. So this is an example of uh, utilization changes from uh, 2017 to uh, 2018. And so in that table, uh, the second column is the number of students 
in city schools own buildings last year and this year and then the change so we lost about even though our enrollment decline was about 1800 when you just focus on the students in our buildings it's actually 2200 students that's 2200 student difference and then when you look at the SRC change from last year to this year so we uh, for our buildings not taking into account our, our swing spaces so we had we surplus the building and then some of our larger buildings um, then became swing spaces and so that decreased our SRC. And so the gist here is that even though we decreased our SRC, um, not taking into account swing spaces by 3,000 seats, we still declined by 2,000 students. And so that's the uh, continued challenge we have with trying to reach that 86% utilization target. Right, and this slide just summarizes uh, exactly what I just said, that um, when we initially came up with these utilization targets, we intended, uh, our enrollment projections indicated that we would meet these targets, but over time, uh, as that other slide indicated, those uh, enrollment projections for those out years have decreased because we've been experiencing uh, these recent enrollment declines. And so that will continue to impact us. And uh, uh, we're just continuing to try to make the CEFMP more accessible. So there's a lot of data here. There is a lot, there are a lot of maps. And so uh, what we're working on is uh, how we distill some of this information into uh, some web maps that we can uh, have on the website so people can uh, better access our data and, um, and just have more access to what's going on within, and having that access to having um, the context for what's going on in the neighborhoods around them with also, you know, what's going on in the, the schools that their student, their children attend. And then just a, an update on the rezoning. So we completed the rezoning feasibility study. The final report is on the uh, website, just a reminder to the public. Uh, we, the city, uh, conducted this rezoning feasibility study to understand and assess the feasibility of potential approaches the district could take uh, for future rezoning efforts. Uh, as I said, all the background information and the final report are on the website. In terms of next steps for rezoning uh, and rezoning analysis and engagement, we've partnered with the Office of New Initiatives to uh, work through these rezoning questions, issues, and challenges as part of the annual portfolio review process. So we'll continue to do um, some analysis as we drill down on specific areas with specific challenges uh, through that process, as well as identify various policies that might need to be uh, addressed, and then also develop uh, a community engagement plan for how we engage the community around um, this, uh, around rezoning as a part of the portfolio process. And then briefly, just an update on some of the other work that my office is doing. Uh, the demand modeling uh, project that we um, are working on so we continue to uh, drill down on uh, that work right now we're partnering with the academics department uh, to look at the entrance continue to look at entrance criteria in high schools so these are just the other dates associated with the timeline we of course after um, on the June 12th, uh, you all will vote on the CFMP to um, approve the CFMP. Then we will also uh, present at the Planning Commission for their approval. And then final submission to the IEC. And Questions? Commissioner Frank? Is this a prerequisite by the state? Yes. And you have to know I'm a city planner by training so I there's a lot of data in here mm -hmm. and and it's all been pulled together extremely well and well presented but I don't see how it ties together into what you would call a comprehensive educational facilities master plan mm -hmm. I don't see how the data in loss of population and stressed mm -hmm. neighborhoods or population change or some of the housing information which you have which mm -hmm. is useful is being used to make decisions about where we're locating our facilities or not locating facilities. And maybe that's another document. I don't know. And, and I don't see how, for example, this ties into INSPIRE. It, maybe mm -hmm. again, wrong document, 
but I don't hear a lot about Inspire. Mm -hmm. The fact that we should be, dis when we make decisions about where to invest in new schools, that we're also trying to have collateral benefits that are occurring around those schools. Right. And at least it seems to me that that goal should be articulated somewhere. Mm -hmm. If not here, maybe there's another document. It's not in the blueprint because that's, you know, and that's what's happening in our classrooms. And the CEO um, has, has, has uh, I think, had the foresight to, to ask us to think creatively about enrollment. But even enrollment is just one element of what happens in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we have probably more impact on what's happening in neighborhoods than any other entity mm -hmm. within the city. So I, I mean, which I'd either need to be educated on what is this supposed to be mm -hmm. um, before, I would, I would ask, before it comes back um, for a vote, is this in fact fulfilling the purpose mm -hmm. that we want it to fulfill? Is it meeting the state requirement? Mm -hmm. And if not, could we also at least articulate in here some sense <coughs> of um, objective that might speak to these larger community issues so that a long-term objective is, as we think about where our facilities are located, where our facilities mm -hmm. are closed, that they have larger impacts and that we work with the intersection of our schools and our decisions with the decisions that are made by other entities throughout the city that affect what's happening in neighborhoods like Bellar Edison and others around the city. So I would just ask that we think about that. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe this isn't the right document, but I just haven't seen one where it would go. So th those so are my comments. So I'll just speak, speak uh, briefly to that. So thank you for uh, your comments. So the uh, CEFMP is a requirement of the state, and uh, there are elements that need to be included in every CEFMP every year. There's actually a checklist uh, um, that right. we have to check off on the items that we have to include. Many of the things you saw tonight are not requirements, but things that we're doing because we see that need to have a better understanding of what's going on across the district in terms of enrollment and housing. So those aren't actually requirements, but I will say that the CEFMP is a 600-page document with seven chapters <laughs> and 10 appendices. Really? Yes. But, and, if I can, and if I can add on it, one of the other things is that the state uses the CEFMP for a number of things. When we submit our 21st century um, <coughs> projects, they look at it. Um, we have information at CMP, like Nicole said, it's a huge document. Right. We have information about neighborhood changes. Um, it's always a continual ongoing justification for every decision that we're making with the 21st century projects, with our capital improvement projects, even though these are systemic projects, but they are also reviewing that. You know, is if there is enrollment changes that are happening in adjacent school zones based on if we submitted um, one example with Robert, um, not Robert Poole, but um, with uh, Patterson High School. They're using the CFMP to look at all of that information and neighborhood changes. Um, I do believe that city planning does pull some of the information when they're creating their Inspire um, plans. They're also pulling some of the information out of the CFMP too. I think we probably should be more um, direct in how mm -hmm. other organizations are using the document. I appreciate you came enticingly close and maybe mm -hmm. if you hadn't come so close I wouldn't have thought about it. Mm -hmm. You put lots of data in here that really helps inform decisions mm -hmm. that affect neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. I do appreciate that and I, at some point in some discussion in some forum and in some document we could have a conversation about that maybe. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's called the annual portfolio review. I mean, when we look at the annual portfolio review, every single line on that, there's a, a document that we get that's an uh, eight and a half by 14 that shows a tremendous amount of detail around the rationale, the, the, the um, enrollment capacity, the amount of space that's available, the condition of the building, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a lot of, that seems like it, it all comes together in that that's our portfolio review, our decisions on where to build, where the new schools are built was based on that analysis, our decisions of which schools to close. There's academic performance factors in there. There's the age of the buildings. I, I, I've always thought of that annual portfolio review as, as a place where it all comes together because that's actually where we're asked to make decisions. Um, so, and the Inspire is really only 21st century. That That's not a citywide process. It's, it's just the, trying to connect the dots around those new buildings. And so I would say directly to that point, Chapter 2 uh, actually has all the different um, information about Inspire and where they're located and um, some of the other information from city, like actual residential developments and where they're um, happening. 
policy. Um, just to clarify, we're going to be asked to approve a document like this, or what you're saying the document is different from what you presented. So, I'm so the CFMP, right? So it is a uh, document about this thing. Okay. Uh, and uh, this PowerPoint represents a snapshot, so I can make okay. sure that you Didn't have a um, link to I've read, I've read it. I've read uh, the full document. Uh, just to give some context, uh, we, we, we will continue to still work on the document, so this presentation is just a snapshot. Uh, we won't actually complete the document until closer to the July 1st deadline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't understand that there okay. was a much different right. And then I think we should think about this also in terms of sort of um, some phases. So I've been here um, about a year and a half, and we're just continuing to add to what we're doing. So the community mapping is one piece. Uh, we've been uh, having some discussions with for some additional support. And I did take your comment and actually talk to the Inspire folks uh, last week about how we can do start to do some specific asset mapping. Uh, and then again, you know, we're continuing to have discussions about uh, how we're. So if you look in um, one of our uh, Appendices, Appendix D, you'll actually see the sort of different community indicators and the different investments that we're making in terms of facilities against those different conditions. And so we're just continuing to evolve what this work is, and I do appreciate the comments uh, about how we can further develop this work, and I uh, anticipate further comments from uh, the board on that. Any other questions, comments? Thanks. Next up, um, there's two waiver requests. Um, Ms. Alvarez is going to uh, present them together. One is the um, AFIA waiver request and BARD. Angela, are we asked to take a vote on this tonight? No. Okay. Uh, your vote in the next. That's what I thought, because I, given where it falls, it falls on the agenda, I just. Okay, so we're just presenting so the public is aware of the requests. Um, Angela Alvarez, Executive Director of the Office of New Initiatives. Um, we have two um, waiver requests before you. For all waiver requests, um, schools must submit an official request um, that includes uh, evidence or demand, um, evidence of demand or capacity to implement whatever that change is that they're requesting, their rationale for why it's necessary and why it meets the school need. Uh, evidence of how they engage stakeholders um, in embedding and approving the request they're moving forward with. Um, we also look at the quality of the programming um, and in cases where it impacts facility, the building capacity to uh, absorb the request. Um, uh, requests that, uh, you know, provide sufficient evidence are then vetted with a variety of offices depending on the type of requests. Um, we also vet with the um, Charter and Operator Led Advisory Board, um, and we present it to the board, and you vote on the request. Oops, not too far. Uh, so first is a request. It was submitted on time, so we have a time of the year when we consider CAP requests. It's tied to, this is tied to a more complicated uh, request that we're trying to figure out. Um, so that's why you're seeing this off cycle. So I just want to be clear. For members of the public or any schools that are looking at it, um, you know, that we don't typically look at CAP requests here. It's off cycle uh, because of a complicated request we're still working through. Um, but it's basically for um, an additional eight students uh, for AFIA's middle grades program. It was submitted on time in the normal time frame. Um, uh, it's tied to some refinancing um, they need to do around the facility. Um, they do have the capacity to meet the students. They have a strong wait list. They're a school with a uh, track record of getting five-year renewals. Uh, we are recommending that the board approve the request uh, stated. Um, I don't know if there are any questions about this request. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the last request is from um, Bard High School Early College Baltimore. Um, they're requesting a waiver of their contract um, to allow them to accept city school staff uh, who live in the county uh, who want to uh, who are qualified and want to be able to enroll their um, children in the school. Uh, so some of the additional considerations just to flag is 
Um, so uh, BARD is the only school um, in our district with a limitation in their contract that requires that they only accept students who live in the city. So other schools have the ability uh, to accept uh, students who live outside of the city uh, within uh, city schools. Um, uh, in the uh, original contract, the thinking was to make sure that we had an, uh, this kind of option for students and protect that for the students within our city. With what's happening with enrollment, um, um, and um, uh, that this would be limited, um, so parts only looking into this in very limited circumstances, um, staff is recommending that um, the board approve it only for a max of five students per year and only after qualified students who live in the city uh, have been offered a seat. Uh, so those are the those are the requests. Questions? I have a question that may not be for her, but may be for staff. If students are um, leaving one school and and going to another, does that impact enrollment? Saying that we're losing students or anything like that. Like these students that are wait li wait listed for this for Afia, I think. So that if they are accepted into, never mind. I'm just maybe yeah. it's just late. If you're never mind. <laughs> if you're on a wait list, then you're not enrolled. No, it depends. If you're on the wait and wait list, you're not enrolled. Right. But, but they but might be in another, another school. They could be in another right. school. You're likely in a, depending on the grade level, you may be in other schools. You may, you may not be in city schools. Yes, you, may not be you, you could be in a variety of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the hmm? so student, excuse me, can I? Yes. So Commissioner Bandina. Huh? Yes. <laughs> See, I'm asleep. So, so, the students who would be accepted into the school are non city residents. Um, they would not be paying? They would not. So, under, district, or under current district policy, children of staff who live in the county. Mm -hmm. Um, are not required to pay the tuition. Okay. So that's per the, the current policy. So we already give uh, permission mm -hmm. to do this at other schools? Yes. It's just that we're asking for this particular school. Yes, because we put a limitation around the school when it was originally approved. It was a different context. We weren't uh, okay. dropping in enrollment like we are right. today. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Richardson. I just, thank you. Um, I just want to be clear. So you're saying their acceptance would only happen after um, a city kid has applied and gotten it. Right. They would only be, so it would be conditional uh, after they've so if offered it to qualified city students. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And it would be limited to five. So like you can use it to, you know, Commissioner Chinia? Yeah, I just I just need some clarification how that falls into the normal process for applying. This BARD, there's a lottery? Or so, no. is BARD just a, a entrance criteria school? So, um, so BARD is a contract school that has soft criteria. So it's not like a city or a poly where grades and all those come into play. Mm -hmm. Um, for um, BARD student, uh, for people who are applying to BARD, um, there is a interview process and a um, seminar process. Um, they are not allowed to look at grades. Um, uh, part of their um, uh, philosophy and their approach and what we agree, uh, agreed to, what the board agreed to in approving them, um, is to look for and identify students who are interested uh, in doing college level work but who may not on paper show up in that way. So the interview um, and the seminar is designed to, to identify students who, um, you know, they may not have like the best grades, for example. So it's really about uh, that, uh, ascertaining interests and um, doing college level work. So then the staff's, um, a staff member whose child were to apply would just go into the same we go through the same process. process, same pool of possible candidates. Yes. Other questions? 
Thanks, Angela. 18.05 uh, and 18.06 will be presented together. Uh, policy GBI and JJL, one on employee participation in political activities, first reader, and the other one, student participation in political activities, first reader. Okay, gentlemen. <laughs> Start your engine. Good evening. Uh, <laughs> good evening, Board Chair Cassani and Board Members, Dr. Santelisis. My name is Jerome Jones. I'm Director of Labor Relations, and I'm going to speak on employee GBI, employee participation in political activities. Uh, currently, we do not have a board rule, a board policy. Uh, that governs an employee's rights to participate in political activities, nor how that looks as far as uh, um, how they're con to conduct themselves in a school setting. So this policy and administrative regulation provides pr parameters for such activities and then safe, at the same time safeguarding uh, the student's rights to learn in a non-partisan environment. Uh, the policy overall, it provides uh, def relevant definitions. It recognizes citizens' rights to um, participate in the political process to include voting, running for office, and serving in public office. Uh, it, does, it does say that employees cannot gauge in these political activities during the workday in the school settings. Uh, employees may discuss political issues with colleagues, but outside of the presence of employees. Uh, but also, uh, employees may be assigned to monitor student clubs, but strictly in a non-participatory uh, way. As far as the regulation, um, it outlines acceptable employee activities. Uh, such as voting, belonging to community organizations, uh, being active members in political parties. Uh, employees may express their political views, but only away from the presence of students. So it separates them from uh, imparting their political views on students. Uh, and instructional activities where political views are expressed are discussed in a broad spectrum as a part of an instructional process and must be nonpartisan. And also, uh, it talks about the use of leaves if an employee is engaging in their political, uh, their rights to political activities. Uh, it also, this, the regulation also cautions and restricts certain activities about engaging, not engaging in activities while on the job. Uh, not while in the classroom in front of students, uh, displays, certain, outlaw, uh, prohibits certain types of displays such as t-shirts, um, banners, um, those types of activities in the classroom, uh, prohibits employees from using any city school's property, uh, any, the copiers, email to express their political views, and the display of political paraphernalia on a desk or in other manners must be minimized to influ influence students. So overall, it, it uh, outlines employees' rights to engage in the political process while separating, making sure that they understand those rights should not be done in a way that will influence students' uh, understanding of the process. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Davis. All right. Uh, John Davis, uh, Chief of Schools, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the student participation in political activities and, and this particular policy. Like the policy Jerome discussed, uh, we do not currently have a rule or policy specifically around students' right to participate in political activities. Um, and the policy and the administrative regulation is really around student expression and how a student can participate in political campaigns during the school day. Here are the main points of the policy. 
Um, you can see that students can exercise the right to vote. Um, they can create clubs of a political nature. Uh, they can have the right to express their point of view. But what I would always point out is where we kind of draw the line is when there's any type of disruption to the classroom or school activities or any type of school operations. Uh, outside the classroom, students can distribute campaign literature. But again, it can't disrupt the flow or interfere with instruction. We also ended up in this policy with high school students being able to participate in the election process and missing up to three school days. We came up with that as we looked over other board policies, and you can see them from different um, jurisdictions there. Uh, we ended up coming up with what we thought was the best policy with respect to talking about high school students, saying that they can miss up to three days and really saying that those three days can happen anywhere as long as they are working with a political campaign. Um, and again, right, there's different jurisdictions do it differently and they kind of maybe differentiate the grade levels. We thought it should be really high school students um, in any grades 9 through 12. The administrative regulation follows the policy. And again, student-led clubs of political natures are acceptable. They can engage in political expression, again, as long as it does not form any type of disruption. Uh, the political campaigns, again, are for students in grades 9 through 12. They can miss up to three days. Submit a, they should submit a work product at the end of that completion as well. Um, and it could go towards service learning requirements as long as they're aligned. And with that, we'll answer any questions that people have. Yes, I have a question. I don't know if you answered it already. But um, an employee who's uh, running for election, um, or in, uh, running for election and uh, might have to go into 90-day session, uh, do we have a policy for how long? Can they take a leave of absence? Yes, we, we currently have a board rule, which is part of bringing on the uh, absence, uh, new absence policy, allows the board to approve a political leave of absence is it is an unpaid leave of absence and board the board can approve a leave up to a uh, year 90 oh up to a year up to a year every year the person would have to come back and ask for uh, approval of that leave again okay. so we've had we've had employees who have been involved in in uh, held political office and for the duration of while they're in office right. they get an approved leave yeah, I knew that, but I didn't know how much time we allow for them to do to do this. Okay, thank you, Mr. Canham. Um, did I read that uh, correctly, uh, John? About we're saying students can distribute literature if it doesn't disrupt the school day of a candidate within the building. Yes. Is, is that normal? I thought I thought that that's not a big deal. No. Uh, I thought I thought you know. You couldn't use our polling places, like, you know, yeah, we, we were really restrictive. Um, I didn't know whether that broke any laws or, I, I could I understand students advocating, but actually having campaign literature distributed within our buildings seems, even though it's done by students, it seems inappropriate. So there is, there is a board policy FKA for other uses of, um, uh, the use of city schools property and in the case of elections there may be rules in that policy that govern who can give out uh, information on election day but um, that's the only other place there may be um, some type of policy against that okay so I know it's late I don't want to get into it that's a yeah. question I have of the appropriateness yeah, without of a doubt and being the first reader we'll do more yeah, research yeah. Okay. on that absolutely Commissioner Frank quick question on, on something like this on a policy for example that bars the use of emails what is the penalty would a penalty be in the policy to the a penalty the would be in a regulation in a so regulation. the regular uh, within this uh, regulation it could be up to and including dismissal but it would be it would be contained in a regulation the yes the penalty. thanks not 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 the stepping of the of the um, penalty it just uh, states that it could be anything up to and including uh, dismissal and so 
because in the case of certificated employees or any employee uh, prior to a deprivation, of, you know, taking them away their job, they have a right to due process. And so that process would govern uh, what the penalty looks like. Commissioner Hassan? If I can, I'm sorry, if I can just add to um, what Jerome said, this is Sally Robinson, Office of Legal Counsel. In the board's policy regarding acceptable use of technology, I believe it's policy EGD, um, and it's, it's got two administrative regulations that go with it, one for employees and one for students. There are details about what happens and what the potential consequences are for misuse of technology. But what we can do is make sure we can add a cross-reference to those in the, in the policies. Commissioner Hassan. Thank you. Um, you've done some, some great revision on this, Jerome. I appreciate it. Um, just want to call the public's attention to that this is political activity and the definition of political activity being activity directed towards the success or failure of a political campaign. So we're not talking about Black Lives Matter movement. We're not talking about kids protesting an event or waging a different sort of thing that would definitely fall under the lens of it's a political action, but it's not related to political activity. Um, so thank you for fixing that definition and putting it there. Also would suggest to put just a, and it is not something such as, um, just because it, it the I, being political is very different in most people's minds in contemporary society from running for office. Uh, just to make sure that that's crystal clear. Uh, and also highlights that we may need a addendum to our student conduct policy or something around political activities of, of young people. Other questions? Thank you. With that, I'd like to just give a notice for the upcoming meetings. Um, June 5th, 3.30, Teaching and Learning in this room. June 7th, 6.30, PCAB in this room. On June 12th, we'll be back in this room at 3, uh, well, upstairs for executive session at 3 and public board meeting at 5. Operations committee will be on Tuesday, June 19th at 10 in this room. And uh, as was noted earlier, the policy committee will have a board forum on, on the equity policy on Tuesday, June 19th at 4. And I want to note, it was mentioned in one of the presentations, but I want to make a special note. There will be a special board meeting on June 26th at 11 a.m. The sole purpose of that meeting will be to vote on the uh, ELA curriculum. That gives the staff um, the additional time to continue the engagement and, and input. So that'll be June 26th at 11, and that'll be posted appropriately. And with Madam that, Chair, there's also a teaching and learning committee meeting on June 26th at 9. Okay, sorry, it wasn't listed here. I missed it. June 26th at 9, teaching and learning, in addition to the others. And with that, we, uh, may I have a motion to close the meeting? Moved by Commissioner Hassan. Do I have a second? Commissioner McFadden, all in favor? Meeting, vote unanimous 9-0 to close the meeting. Meeting is adjourned. Thanks.